God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because one is never enough and neither was 461, damn it. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath's off this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Hello, it's me, Jehoaham. Oh, okay, all right. I'm not one of your dad's friends. (laughs) (laughs) I'm an old Bible man. Oh, really? Oh, I can tell by the towel that's wrapped around your head, yes. All right, so and uh, we're very excited to welcome in a return guest masochist, along with a brand new one, Dan and Dan from the Data Over Dogma podcast. Dan's. thanks for coming on. Thanks thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation, yeah. We we made the t- the name difficult to pronounce on purpose. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Dan, 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 Dan. <laughs> yep, yep. Dan. Alliteration is is the speed talkers uh, <laughs> bugaboo. I guess greatest enemy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, un- until you said all of this, nobody was going to know I ever screwed it up. It was going to be <laughs> now, now. I have to keep <laughs> oh, it. Thank good, you. That's right. Thank you for that, Dan. <laughs> Two man war against our edit. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, Uncle Dan, what will we be breaking down today? Okay, listen. I blame myself here. I blame you too, Dan. <laughs> I also blame you. This, this is my fault. Uh, I take full responsibility. I thought that, you know, bringing a Bible scholar to onto the show, we should do a Bible movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since we both were both named Daniel, it seemed like it would be funny if we did a movie called The Book of Daniel. But something went terribly wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just a, it's been a while since you guys have had me on the show and I'm too used to good or even like marginally decent films. Or if it's just that like I'm in a bad place with my ADHD, but I have literally no idea what happened in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Everybody whispered the whole time. <laughs> they were stopping for a dramatic pause every four words. Just at I, random. Yeah. I literally could not pay attention to it. It's an hour and a half of listening to your grandpa and his elderly friends at the home telling each other stories about how super important they were at the insurance office where they worked. (laughs) But like in vaguely King Jamesian language. Right. Yeah. It took me 270 hours to watch this film. (laughs) I mean, I took notes and stuff, but I cannot promise that they're coherent. I guess that's why the other Dan is the one with the PhD and I'm you Yeah, know, me. right. Yeah. Right. Dan, if you did not already have an ADHD diagnosis, I would use your notes on this film <laughs> to get you that diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate oh, that. The, the thing is is that like I you know I read the fucking book, so I knew how this movie was going and I just kept watching it with trying to like Imagine it through the eyes of someone who is unfamiliar with the story and like oh. imagine them trying to figure out why the hell anyone was doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love the Data Over Dogma podcast, and I very much do. And who doesn't? But you wanted to watch them face their greatest a historical kind of sort of Bible <laughs> challenge yet. <laughs> You will love this movie. Let let me explain. Okay, Jeremiah and Dan, jump in here. Uh, Not Uncle Dan, jump on in here. (laughs) Jeremiah is when the Bible starts doing a magic trick for itself. Did I pick the seven of hearts? Yes, I fucking did. And that's fine (laughs) if you hide it in Jamesian language, right? If you hide it in high biblical language, and then when a five-year-old asks the question, you're like, you better learn fucking Greek, asshole. (laughs) But (laughs) trying to act it out as a movie is... Okay, it's like yes. everyone in a home has dementia, but also psychic powers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? I want to say best worst set design. Oh, like, boy, this was were- a a 90s single family upper middle class home. Yep. And it was like, throw some (laughs) sticks in the corner, put some drapes here, cover up that light switch. Yeah. And it was awful. (laughs) If you want to know how bad the set design was, just go through there and count how many times we see that same platter of fruit in yeah. different places, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? They, they were stretching that $11 budget when it came to set design. Guys, if you think about it, Bronze Age homes and houses in Arizona today are basically <laughs> identical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
They literally rented this from the same people that they rent like their porn shoots from. One hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And 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 agreed to get it after hours. You know, yeah, exactly. They were like, what's all the scuff marks by the dryer? You know what? We'll deal with it later. <laughs> so, all right. So I was going to go with best worst sound effects guy that was clearly fucking with them. Oh, my God. Because it's incredible. <laughs> everyone in this movie is taking it seriously, right? They, they're trying to stretch out an $11 budget and they're bad actors, generally speaking, and everything's terrible. But like the only person who seems to recognize that entirely is the sound effect guy who just keeps throwing in like a a boy oing here and there. <laughs> and how many times can you use the same computer-generated image of Babylon? Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> it's like so we're es establishing shot. We've seen 11 times already. And looks like a colored pencil drawing. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I bought that copy of Prince of Persia, damn it, and I'm going to get my money straight out of it. <laughs> Speaking of which, I'm going to go with best worst ancient dress. Mm. So... For those of you who haven't heard the Data Over Dogma podcast, and you should, the Dans, they go into like the real details and the real conflicts when it comes to like Bible history and stuff because of Dan's expertise and Uncle Dan's expertise, right? They really get into the nitty gritty. <laughs> yes, and these motherfuckers sure. are walking around with a Land's End towel around their head <laughs> being like, I'm Cyrus, king of, I don't know, France? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm king of Bed Bath and Beyond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I I was going to go, you know, Eli always takes the easy one and I am going to take a page out of his book because my brain went to mush in this movie. So I'm going to take the easy one and say best worst special effects yeah. if you can call them that. <laughs> I started this best worst after the first special effect. We're going to get to both of them, but there are two special effects in this movie and <laughs> literally they're the most important moments in the Daniel story. Yes. And they ended up looking like they talked someone on Fiverr down to 250. <laughs> <laughs> there is two a 250 -er. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Gotta go to the dark web. <laughs> All right, we'll do it. We've got some outright community theater on the other side of this break, so we're going to keep it brief, and when we come back, we'll dive into all the this old towel could make a perfect robe wardrobing of the Book of Daniel. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, podcast listener. I'm No Illusions. And I'm Dan Beecher. You know, sometimes when we get overwhelmed, it can be hard to remember to take a moment. Uh, Eli, you are sitting a little close. Sorry, I'm just trying to, trying to catch your smells. Please don't. Look, social interactions can be overwhelming and we get caught in unhealthy spirals that leave us feeling down. So do you, do you like have the whole Bible memorized? No. Stupid, stupid. Of course, of course not. <laughs> stupid. But one way to help yourself navigate difficult times, whatever you're dealing with, is therapy. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So how many t-shirts do you have? I don't know, lots. Lots, <laughs> me too. Basically the same person, if you think about it. Take a moment. Visit betterhelp.com slash awful today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash awful. I went to Oxford too. For school? No. To visit? Also, no. Then how did I you... I lied! Make... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, thanks so much for coming on. Happy to be here. Yeah, we've been really excited to do this for a while. Okay, so hey, before we get recording, I wanted to give you a warning that we get a little sillier than you might be used to. That is not a problem. We get pretty silly on the Data Over Dogma podcast. Yeah, sure. Right, it's it's just that... Um, Woo! What's up, bean sniffers? It's just that that. D-Dog, D-Money, glad to have you on the pod for the first time. What do you think of my outfit? Ah. Uh... It's revealing. I, I did ask him not to wear it. He did, but I know you're into Jesus stuff or whatever. So I figured what better way to welcome you than my crucifixion thong. See, it's like my wingle wangles on the cross. Yeah, I, I can see that. All right. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to blow up the whoopee cushions. Cushions? Plural? Yeah. Hell yeah. These are your friends, Dan? I mean, friends is a strong word. You guys want a Long Island iced teas? <laughs> it's 9 a.m. 
Still mimosas then. I, I, I think they're good. More for me. I mean, I could do a mimosa. Yeah, right. No, actually, we're going to mention it. <laughs> hey there, podcast listener. It's me, Marky Mark, here to tell you about God Awful Movies live show on September 7th. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Marky Mark, why are you fucking telling us about a live show? Well, I'll fucking tell you why. Because this one's in Boston. That's right, Beantown. The boys are headed to Boston, Saturday, September 7th, and you're not going to want to miss it. So head to godawfulmovieslive.com right now to get your fucking tickets. But don't fucking wait, because our VIP Platinum tickets always sell out in less than a fucking week, you hear me? So one more time, that's godawfulmovieslive.com for your fucking tickets to the live show. And now, back to the fucking podcast. And we're back for the breakdown. We're going to open up on that familiar Pinnacle Peak production logo. It is, of course, a subsidiary of Summit. Apogee, Apex, Climax, Vertex, Zenith, Acme Entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to open our movie up somewhere outside of Babylon. <laughs> it's like way outside because it's in L.A., but it's it's somewhere outside <laughs> of Babylon in 538 BCE. It's like they knew Dr. Dan was going to be watching and they were like, <laughs> you can't you can't be mad at us. We said somewhere, somewhere outside <laughs> of Babylon. <laughs> Everywhere, if you think about it, is. So I'm working. Did he start stitching us? Shit, he started stitching us. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we get Daniel, old Daniel. We're going to have old and young Daniel in this movie. So we meet old Daniel. He's in the desert praying, right? Yeah, we meet him. And again, I know we've talked a lot about the clothes, but I just have to mention it one more time. We meet him with a slow pan up from his fucking mall sandals. Yeah. Right? Like, like it's court evidence, right? They're like, just to be clear. These are very modern sandals. Here's the rubber. <laughs> here's the leather. Here's the very modern cloth they're made of. And you can see the tag that says Birkenstock. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. here's your dad's friend who went through a bad divorce in his late 50s. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so he's praying. He's, he says to God, he's like, hey, man, all the dudes with the high places and goat demons are already dead. Why are you still punishing us for this shit? Right? Yeah. And this is the moment where I knew I was in trouble because when you can't tell if the guy is doing a reedy, high-pitched old man voice or like some form of ancient ASMR, yeah, it's going to be a long movie. What it's was just, that? Like, it's just this breathy, I am, oh God, why am I? I was like, no, no, this is not going to be okay. Well, luckily he doesn't do that through the whole movie, but yeah, for some reason for this opening prayer, he's like, I really want to. I just want to tell you. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you come over here, little boy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It, it, is, it could only be described as a whisper squeak. I don't yeah, know sure. what it is, but sure. it's, that's it. And we, we set the tone, too, for the kind of closely trimmed stubble. Yes. yes. Mm, right. Nobody right. has a full that. beard here. No. Everyone has just been like, oh, I put it on a number two and just took it down. To, <laughs> the to ancient here. Babylonian Norelco. I don't know if you're familiar. <laughs> From your studies. But so he, but then he ends his prayer and like a sword just pokes into screen, into his neck from off screen. And it is like so unintentionally funny. It's so <laughs> funny. A dick could have pushed into his cheek and it would have been slightly <laughs> less ridiculous. So, so then we get our title screen, right? The book of Daniel sort of like a Babylonian steela or something. And, and we go back to the sword neck scene. Oh my God, that sword. Can I just say the sword is visibly dull? Yeah. <laughs> like I have seen pool noodles that are sharper than this sword. <laughs> Commemorative letter opener is the vibe. <laughs> well, the way he's holding it to this guy's neck, if it was remotely sharp, he'd already killed him. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, that, and, and we should point out, by the way, that they're not, they're not even, tr well, some people try for some accents at random, not like, Accents that oh would be my god, the accents. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get to the accents. You just hold on. The line varies from community theater Shakespeare to pretending to be a ghost in the rafters <laughs> is a Scooby Doo villain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we needed Scooby Doo. That is what was missing from this entire thing. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so so we see that there's a guy's got the sword on Daniel, and then a bunch of soldiers come out, and one of the guys, I put a picture in our notes so that I could share this with you guys. One of the dudes is his helmet is over his eyes like Beetle fucking Bailey. Mm -hmm. And he just so good. keeps it there the whole goddamn time. <laughs> in fairness, Noah, when you make 
costume pieces out of a bowl from World Market. Sure. It is not necessarily <laughs> going to stay on the way you want it to. You can't get a fit. That's true. Yeah, no, that's fair. So, but this is where we learn that the guy with the sword, this is this is played by the, the actor is Lance Henriksen. He's the guy who played Bishop in Aliens. He's playing Cyrus the Great. Yeah. He's from like fucking Milwaukee or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was going to say the, <laughs> the white. And look, we always whiteify the Bible in movies and stuff. This is nothing new on this show. But the whiteness in this movie is astounding. Oh, this yeah. is like <laughs> a country club leadership board level of whiteness. <laughs> <laughs> they usually get a tan guy at least. I literally wrote. He is Cyrus the White. I mean, great. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dr. Dan, very important historical question here. Hmm. Was Cyrus's flag actually an eagle doing fushigi? Because I really <laughs> need it to be. Uh, we had several shots of that flag. No, absolutely not. That, oh, that's man. Wrong. Ruins everything with his knowledge. Fushigi ruins everything. <laughs> <laughs> There's also this great moment. Speaking of how dull the sword was, Cyrus says to the Beetle Bailey and all the other soldiers, he's like, um, Leave us, me and this guy I just met. So Beetle Bailey grabs his sword by the blade and <laughs> walks away with it. <laughs> All right, so, but then the old praying guy introduces himself. He's like, I'm Daniel. I'm here to tell you a story. And he's like, is the story going to like take up the rest of the movie? He's like, sure the fuck is. <laughs> I just wonder, like the whole thing, there's a moment in this where Cyrus is, guy that we then we later his advisor that we later learn is Croesus comes up and mm. they, they have a talk they are outdoors in the middle of the desert and they're still whispering <laughs> I just make, do, do they not know how to turn down the gain on their audio equipment that might be it, it. just if it was just like every single but everybody in this whole movie is whispering the whole time. I don't understand. Yeah. To be fair, all the actors in this movie were around when home computer was how it was sold. So I can understand why they don't matter with just the game. Hey, hey. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so but what I what I love about this scene too is because Croesus comes up to him, he's the one who's like, uh, King Cyrus, this is this is Daniel from the Bible, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he spoils the lion shit. He's like, he's the one that survived in the lion's den. And I'm like, spoilers, <laughs> Croesus. We haven't seen the fucking flashback yet, <laughs> man. Yeah, but they know we know. Which is kind of their problem from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. That we all know all of the good stuff that's gonna happen in this. And it's the only interesting parts of the movie. Right. So they are they're, they're kind of fucked from the from the jump. Yeah. yeah the the whole movie is just exposition. And <laughs> well, exactly. the, like the sequel is go read the book now. Right. <laughs> right. So okay. So they all settle into Cyrus's tent for a movie length flashback. This is where Cyrus offers him some wine, but he can't take it because it's not kosher. Yeah. Something like that, I guess. <laughs> And so and and Bishop like pours out his wine all dramatically. He's like, "Oh, my wine's so not funny. good for you." <laughs> yeah. and, and again, it's for no reason, right? They're later going to talk about why he can't take a different king's wine and blah 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 blah. Yeah. But this scene, there's no reason for the king to be like, "Well, whenever I hand someone a cup, if they don't drink it, I pour it on the ground next to me, <laughs> on the floor of my tent." So yeah. now my toga's a little wet. <laughs> Happy birthday to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but so, but Cyrus, that he's like, he demands a story like Eli's kid talking to my wife, right? He's like, <laughs> you said you'd tell me a story. Tell me a story. He's like, oh, okay. So I got a, a story of four different kings to tell you. And we're going to start with Nebuchadnezzar and Dan, Uncle Dan. This is why I resent you because you know I can't spell normal words. <laughs> my attempts at Nebuchadnezzar in this script are a war crime. I could go to jail. <laughs> It literally has an X in it, you guys. <laughs> it does. It does. I was I was so excited. I actually spelled Nebuchadnezzar right on my first try. I spelled it and I'm like, all right, the fucking spell check isn't underlining it, but that can't be right. I looked it up and I was right. Oh, I peaked and you guys were here. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, there you go. I do want to point out that this last scene was the scene where we are introduced to the fact that every actor in this movie went to the Christopher Walken slash William Shatner school yes. of weirdly placed mm -hmm. pauses in lines. Well, that's acting. I don't know if you know yeah. uh, Dan or not, but that's how acting 
is done. It's actors over the age of 60 <laughs> trying to remember their lines. Yeah. <laughs> That's 100% what it was in many cases. Just yeah. Yeah. stopping. There's a thing about the shoe. Waiting for someone to turn a cue card around. <laughs> well, right, because when, when your vision starts to go, they have to make those cue cards really Right, they're big, so much so, bigger, yeah. yeah. Right. And of course, as old Daniel starts telling the story, we learn that every part, that the actor playing old Daniel thinks that every part of the story is the most important part of the story. Yeah, for sure. Throughout the entire fucking movie, every Forever. single actor. Yes. For every line delivered is either wacky comedy or the most important thing. And But that's the thing, right? Because they're all... They're they're taking this shit from the Bible. They're like, well, you know, we got to be very reverent with it. And that's what you end up with. <laughs> so, okay. So we get our dramatic title card. It's just the first king. And then we get that fucking colored pencil drawing of Babylon. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind of amazing. I mean, I think artistically it's interesting. They only sprung for one of them. So we keep cutting back to the same thing. Yeah. And there's one moment, I'm going to get to it later, where it becomes problematic that they've cut to yeah. the exact same picture again. <laughs> well, so now I want to clear up. I want to be clear. There are two, right? There's the night one and the day one because there's a different one that's just <laughs> black, but there's little yellow boxes where the windows yeah. are. That's right. It's basically Rivendale. They've got like arches and bridges <laughs> right. and these like alpine mountains hanging over the, the palace because, you know, Mesopotamia, the, the land between two rivers is covered in all of these rocky peaks. <laughs> well, yeah, the Alps, the Alps used to extend may, way further south. I don't know if you yeah. know the history. Climate change. <laughs> yeah, that's what got but yeah, so, so yeah, we cut to the, there's the exiles from Jerusalem arriving in Babylon, I guess. And this is great. Because the gay fear around this scene is so intense, right? Because Nebuchadnezzar was like, send me your unmarked, smartest, hottest boys. And this movie is like, he wanted them for knowledge. Smart stuff, knowledge stuff. <laughs> reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does say, you know, this is still in the voiceover from old Daniel. And he's like, young men without any physical defect and showing aptitude for every kind of learning one of whom was myself. It's like <laughs> getting a little Trumpy there with the narcissism there, buddy. Right. Like this, this story really falls apart in a lot of places. If you have to, re if you remind yourself that Daniel is the one telling us right, right. Yeah, over and over, it's going to, it's like, and I was the wisest man in the land again. Can you believe it? It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and these, these stories likely originate in, in court tales that came from Babylon. And so at the very beginning, they're like, so we, uh, there were these four of us and they just, Arbitrarily changed our name. Yes, right. <laughs> and was, yeah, it's like, and I was Belteshazzar. And the reality is that somebody anciently was like, "Well, let's put this story in here," but they have entirely different names. Then put in there that the king changed their names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. That's right. I was perfect. Daniel Belteshazzar was my middle name. Yeah, well, yeah the, the Bronze Age didn't have multiverse technology yet. Obviously, <laughs> just for clarity's sake. This is well after the Bronze Age. <laughs> we, are, we, we are over 600 years after the Bronze Age. That's fair, yeah. <laughs> we should point out, too, that the, that the silly pencil drawing that we saw at the beginning as the establishing shot of Babylon is also the, <laughs> the same view they have out their window, mm -hmm. apparently. Mm -hmm. right? They, so they all gather up and look out the window to pray to God. And then the guy that's playing young Daniel, this is the first time we see him, now he's decided to play this role with a with a British accent. A hundred percent British accent. I <laughs> I didn't catch what was happening at first, and the other guys in the scene, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, slip in and out of British accents. <laughs> yeah. I assume, yes. presumably, because this other guy just starts doing one, and he, they're all like, "Oh, are we are we doing the? Are we doing are British? We doing Do we I don't know if we're doing. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, so actually, actually, I went down the rabbit hole on this a bit because, like, a lot of the people just speak with their normal fucking Midwestern accent in this movie. I was like, why would this guy, who obviously isn't British, do this terrible British accent for this movie? And I looked him up. He's Australian. Oh. Right, so they can't have him sound Australian. That would just be silly. The whole time. Nebuchadnezzar. Ah, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. Now. Right, right. Yeah, can you imagine oh, an no. Australian person trying to Not say the Nebuchadnezzar? the lions, Dan. Fuck. <laughs> ah, the fucking lions. Oh, no, the beautiful creatures, lions. Okay, Love that's my path to Christianity. Right, that's what <laughs> that's what they always say. Is they just it's a Bible done entirely in Australian accent. I'm back in. <laughs> I'm saved, baby. 
There are some Bible translations out there that take the behold and uh, they change it. So the, the translations replace it with look, buddy. <laughs> and so it's just, it's just the King James version, but it's yep. look, buddy. <laughs> I love it. All improvements are, all changes are improvement. <laughs> So yeah, so they're all settling into their new digs. All the non-Daniel guys are super bummed and and losing faith. So he has to prop them up, and he's like, "Guys, we're in a we're in a fucking Bible prophecy." Like Jeremiah said, or Isaiah, whoever it was, said that we would be here for like seventy years, right? Yeah, don't worry. I am going to choose the seven of hearts. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that this scene. Like so many, like a shocking number of the movies that you guys make me watch mm -hmm. starts with a guy in fake, badly pretended, tearful prayer. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. just, that is such a trope in these movies <sighs> that someone's like, oh God, why have you done it? It's just so bad. I don't yeah. know. There's something amazing about that. We get quite a bit of it. Yeah. So they get done with their tearful prayers then they go for dinner and exposition, right? Yeah, more <laughs> exposition. Well, yeah, right. They they were just doing exposition, but yeah. So this is also where we meet a character that I call Eunuch Steve, right? I don't know <laughs> the character's name, but again, no no attempted at accent. He's just a white guy from Milwaukee, and he is dressed. And I'm the only one who noticed this in in their fucking notes. He is dressed as Fred goddamn Flintstone throughout the entire movie, <laughs> and no one else acknowledges that. Yep. Right? He's got the orange thing with the with the black spots all over it, and it's... Uh, yeah, okay. I didn't notice it possibly because I was watching this actor desperately trying not to do the giant, big, bold gay voice that he had brought in <laughs> from, from home. <laughs> the, the, the director had very clearly nixed, but he was like, I'm going to get a few in. I'm just going to put an H on a couple of S's and we'll let it lie as it lies. <laughs> There's also a great moment where like, one of the guys is like, hey, we need to make a pact with each other to stay Jewish no matter what happens. And Daniel's like, he has this real condescending rejection where he's like, no, no, all we need to do is remember to love our God and remain faithful to him. And the other guy's like, I said stay Jewish. That's, That's the I same said. fucking thing, man. I wanted the other guy to be like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> That's you. It's you, Daniel. That's what you sound like. <laughs> but th then they bring food and they're all, they have to go mm -hmm. like, is it, it's probably not kosher though, huh? None of this. <laughs> Yeah, I was very confused by this because they're like, oh, what is this meat? And he has like a whole horror description to the yeah. food. He's like, the pigs are fed the prisoners and the cows watch a rape every morning. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the chickens all read mein Kampf every day before <laughs> breakfast. And they're like, yeah, we can't eat that. <laughs> It, it is ridiculous. Why did they think there needed to be seven non-kosher things about the food? <laughs> well, this is actually a problem with the text because there's nothing really in the laws that that require they reject this food. like the Because it doesn't even talk about meat. In the Aramaic text, it just refers to the portion of the king and the wine. And so there's not there's not really a specific law we can point to and say that's why. And so this movie is kind of apologizing for the book of Daniel by <laughs> filling in the gaps and saying, oh, here are all the reasons. Oh, okay. That they, and, yeah. and this movie does this all the time. Throughout the movie, it, it sprinkles in all these explanations to try to cover up the problems with chronology, the problems with history, the problems with logic in the book of Daniel. Yeah. So it's, it's going along fixing the, the story as it goes. A lot, lot of retcon going on. ludicrous ways. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> None more fun than when they have to try to deal with the whole Darius Cyrus thing. Yeah. Yes! Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. it's so good. <laughs> well, I kept going like, did he have an Uncle Darius? <laughs> <laughs> he had a double Uncle Darius. Oh, yeah, Shut right. up. No, we'll get there. Double we'll get there. uncle, yeah. So, okay. So, but then he's like, well, you know, look, we can't eat your food. How's this for a deal? We'll just go vegan for 10 days. And if we don't waste away, then then that's the solution, right? Right. We're going to look better than those keto guys. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but again, here's the problem with using the Bible for your source material, right? Because this is so boring, right? But you have to put it in because it's a thing that happens in the book of Daniel. Not much happens yeah. in the book of Daniel. So you have to use this and it has to be a dramatic moment so that those of us who are big Bible fans are, are, are watching along going, ooh, ooh, I know this part, right? <laughs> Point of order, not much story about Daniel happens in the book of Daniel. Yeah, A lot of like 
stuff that's not included in this movie happens in the book of Daniel. And it's true. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Namely, the second half of the book of Daniel. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And it's also because every line has to be so dramatic. It is so monotone. Like yes. there are no peaks and valleys in this movie. Everybody is white knuckled teeth gritted. <laughs> yes. This is the most important moment of my life. Yeah. Do you have any soy nuggets? <laughs> <laughs> I literally glazed over several times and had to go back and rewatch. Be this, it's what I talked about before. Yeah. When everything is important, literally nothing is important. You can't even pay attention to it. Yep. Well, and then so we back out of the flashback long enough for modern day Daniel to tell King Bishop or uh, King Cyrus that like this is actually very credible and it makes total total sense actually that we would do this <laughs> and that they would let us do this yeah right but yeah so they 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 were fucking vegetarian for a while which is the plot of the movie so far then we go back to the flashback <laughs> using that same pencil drawing establishing shot of Babylon right and now I guess we're a few years into the future they're all be they've all been educated in the ways of Babylon and they're going to be presented to King Nebi. Yeah. yeah, and they just keep adding unnecessary death stakes to every scene, right? So <laughs> yeah. they're literally about to walk into the chamber, and he's like, oh, I forgot to mention, if the king doesn't like the three sentences you're going to say to him, he's going to murder you guys. And so, you me. know, try and, really, and me, also me, which is a lot of turnover in my job, as you can probably <laughs> imagine. So, um, no pressure, just don't screw it up or we all die. <laughs> So yeah, right. So they walk in. Nebuchadnezzar looks bored by their presence. He says, he's, his first question is, who am I? And I'm like, nice. Start simple. Let them build their confidence. Can I also just jump in here and say that when they enter the room, and this continues throughout the movie, when an important moment happens, they punctuate it with a gong? Yes. Yes. <laughs> is that sound effect guy. Where the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> you only start to notice it about halfway through the movie, and then it gets like really obvious and sarcastic. <laughs> like someone will step out and be like, oh, I forgot my water bottle. Gong. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it twice. Gong. <laughs> it's like one of those stores that has a door chime and you're a kid and you just run back and forth in front of it. That's how the gong works. I literally had to go down a rabbit trail just to figure out if gongs were used in the Middle East. <laughs> which they weren't, by the no, way. No, no. Right. Yeah. This was, this was probably the director like, how are we going to punctuate the important parts that are extra important? Right, <laughs> oh, well, right. Just, yeah, exactly. Let's have somebody ring a gong. When you can't rely on the actors for that, no, nope. you're, you're, you're kind of out of luck. So, But young Daniel gives him this speech about how their God is totally cool with them serving other people as long as they're in a different zip code than him and they don't, he doesn't hear about it later, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. But Nebuchadnezzar's like, all right, well, maybe I'll take Yana as my advisors and maybe I won't. Would you tell me shit that I don't want to know? It's a trick question. Don't answer. It's a <laughs> yeah, trick. Yeah, right. It's always <laughs> a trick question, man. But that, but this is where Daniel throws out what might as well be his tagline in the movie, right? Where he says, "Oh, it's his, it's his catchphrase. It is such a, it is such a goofy." They go back to it like five or six times. That's going to be on the poster. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. If you don't want to, if you don't want the truth, it's best not. I don't remember exactly how he says it. Don't, don't ask me anything or whatever if you don't want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. So then we we back out of the flashback long enough to explain why this totally makes sense, right? This is where. Cyrus is like, no, yeah, no, I totally, you you take your enemies and you make them very, very close to you and rely on them. It makes total sense, actually, if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we get the, he conquered me, but we're cool now side plot, which I really like. Yes, this is where we <laughs> introduce that the lackey has been Croesus the whole time, the former king of Lydia. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and and th this is just, this is just one of the themes throughout the entire movie is like, no matter what happens, if if the bad, if you're the enemy, but you know, things are cool now, then uh, everything's fine. Right. I would love for that to actually be the case, though. You're just sitting there next to the guy who you just conquered his land and killed all his people, and it's like, so what do you think we should do about agriculture? <laughs> oh, I think you should have left my kingdom alone. <laughs> <laughs> How's that chair? Is it comfortable? Yeah, I just had it made. Just had it made for my birthday. <laughs> my birthday. <laughs> And this is the the tradition of of Croesus staying on as as Cyrus's advisor is almost certainly legendary. The most most scholars think that uh, when Cyrus defeated him, he either was killed or took his own life. Well, there you go. 
Well, now you're making it a bummer, Dan. Yeah. We're trying to, the movie is trying to historicize the book of Daniel. It's trying yes. to say, hey, look at this thing that happened over here. It ties in. These are all interconnected. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I think they're trying to like leave people with the impression that, you know, Cyrus and Croesus hanging out and talking about Lydia was in the Bible somewhere. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, trying to historicize Daniel is slightly harder than making us care about season three of Loki. So, like, yeah. you got to give these people their due. <laughs> oh, that's fair. <laughs> well, but Owen Wilson might not. Oh, <laughs> okay, so, so now we're, okay, we're back in the flashback. Nebuchadnezzar wakes up from a nightmare, sitting straight up. Yes, they did that to me. And also, <laughs> he's in, like, like, I've seen this bed at fucking Ashley phone, uh, yeah. home furnishings or whatever, yeah. right? Like This, this is, jumped out at me. It's like, nice four-post bed. We've got the foot locker at the foot. <laughs> yes, like, this right. is standard upper middle class white dude bedroom. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then he's like, when they ask about, he's like, bring my advisors. And uh, I just got very Walmart Gary Oldman yelling, everyone! Yeah, and, and, right. And yeah. professional when he's like, all of them! Yeah, he goes, he goes, well, do you want me to bring your enchanters, your sorcerers, or your astrologers? And he's like, all of them! And he brings three guys! Yeah, okay. <laughs> But really, no illusions, he only brings one guy. He brings, and thank you so much for confirming this for me, Dr. Dan, because I felt like I was crazy. One of the astrologers is played by by Gallagher. Is yeah. that really yeah. Gallagher or did he just- It is 100% him. 100 Holy shit, Gallagher. I just ha I had him as Gallagher in my notes, but I just thought he looked like, my God, how far he has fallen. <laughs> well, yeah. and Which is good because he's a piece of shit. Well, so, now yeah. he's dead. Yeah, yeah. We all discovered that, that he's a right wing nut job. I mean, not since he died, but yeah. Yeah, not since right. he died. Now well, he's yeah. very left wing. Yeah. <laughs> by, being, <laughs> by being a racist who died. We love that. We stand. But, <laughs> But what's amazing is that, like, he very clearly thought there was going to be a moment where Gallagher, <laughs> the world's greatest comedian, got to show his chops. Never fucking happens. Nope. You can see him wind up in three scenes. He's like, well, I think, and they're like, cut. It's so fucking... <laughs> The sledgeomatic was just off camera. You hit something with a the hammer. Sledgeomatic was just off camera at all times. <laughs> yeah. I promise you. Did you need? He brought several. I have, I have watermelons. I just think that, like, you're right that he kept getting cut off. He didn't have a moment to be, you know, a big Mo Gallagher moment on screen. And yet there was enough space for him to show that he's a genuinely terrible actor. He really like, there is. Was, yeah. There was just yeah. enough. Like he said three lines and it was just like, ew, God. And I wonder what the direction was for these three. Like they come in and it's like, just look like bumbling idiots. Yeah. You right, know. like it was like they must have they must have said you you saw the the the, the weasels and Roger Rabbit, right? Kind of <laughs> aim for that, aim for that. Yeah. So yeah, so he's like, I had a terrible dream. I need you guys to interpret it, and they're like, Oh, tell us what you dreamed about. But apparently, he knows the Eli rule, so he's like, No, <laughs> no, you tell me what I dreamed about. You're supposed to be psychic, right? Yeah, and they they're so com they're so mad about it. They're like, You have to. Let me put your cart back in the deck. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fun. Stop. <laughs> yeah, he's like, if you don't tell me what I dreamed by sunrise, I'm going to chop your heads off. Right? Yeah. So then we get young Daniel asking eunuch Steve about that last scene. And he's like, yeah, you know, let's uh, let's go ask the king for clarification. And I love this moment. I, I wouldn't even have brought it up, except that, this, that there's this great moment where eunuch Steve is like, a great king who's threatened to chop people's heads off for not being able to, like, tell what he dreamed. Danny has a question for you. I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just to set the scene a little bit, I want everyone to, re to realize that this, so this is at night, you know, the king woke up from a dream. So it's supposed to be candlelight. And mm -hmm. obviously whoever's in charge of the lighting was like, Turn it to flicker mode and set the yeah. intensity to seizure. Yeah. <laughs> they need a flashing light warning at the beginning of this movie. It is right. so bad. It is hard to watch. And I thought something jumped out at me. They come in and the king says, your death is upon you as well, unless you know my dream and can interpret it. And Daniel goes, I am. Yeah. You what? A hundred percent he does. And I was like, what the hell is he responding to? Because it was not what the king just said. No. It's not an answer to what the king just asked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I literally, I puzzled over that one for a while. He says, I, I am and I will. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, <laughs> neither of those make sense, man. But he's like, but I can tell you what you dreamed about. 
He says, you dreamed about a statue with you know different layers of precious metals all along it, and its feet were made of clay, and the, and the clay broke, and a rock that broke, it turned into a mountain. And the whole time he's saying this, I'm reflecting on how much this actor looks like Charlie Tay, you know, in the meme with the yarn <laughs> behind him or whatever. Yeah. And I just I could not take any of this seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, serious. I, I had a different take on it. I sat there watching and it was like, I went into a bit of a reverie myself, but I, I thought it'd be good if it was like, you saw a huge statue with a head of gold, gleaming silver pecs, rippling abs of steel, <laughs> and the cock of the finest. Wait, nope, that's a different dream. And then yeah. there's a different dream. Said, no, not that Hang one, on. not that one. I'm going to start over. asking about it all. <laughs> give, me a different, give me one more chance. You, you had were those cum naked gutters? in the high school. No, that, not that one either. Hold on, hold on. I got it. It's that in. one ended very abruptly. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, but what does the dream mean? And he's like, okay, so you're the head made of gold. And he's like, so far, so good. I like yeah. this. I like this. Mm -hmm. Always a good idea to tell a king that his dream means that he's the best king. That yes, is, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then and then make the rest of your dream interpretation happen in the distant future so that nobody can call you on anything. Right. This yeah. Is, yeah, actually, yeah. This is great technique. Genius technique. It's yeah. absolutely the right way to go. <laughs> yep. But he's like, yeah, so you're five generations from now or whatever, your kingdom is going to fall apart. That's what this dream is all about. And he's like, oh, cool. Your God is awesome. Yeah. Right. <laughs> all, all of Daniel's interpretations are like, oh, well, you're going to die and your kingdom is taken from you and everything sucks. And they're like, give this man all the gold. Yes, give him a purple <laughs> robe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's in charge of everything. And then it's, it's like a, a sitcom because as soon as the next story starts, Daniel is back to just kind of Staying in a trailer out back. Yes. Right. And they're like, wasn't there some dude who did this kind of thing before? <laughs> yeah, right. Thought, <laughs> thought you lost your job in the last episode. <laughs> yeah. 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 So then, okay, so so but the king made Danny ruler over all of Babylon. Again, this will not stick, apparently. There's something that yeah. happens off screen that changes that. And that's how the movie starts. Like it, Really? Yeah. Yeah, because Cyrus, when he takes over, Daniel as an official. If they were keeping him on, they would have just. They, it would have just been a seamless transition, right? It would have just been like, kill that guy. You have his job now. But instead, Daniel's just kind of wandering through, you know, the back lot, and <laughs> suddenly stumbles upon Cyrus's camp. He's like, oh, I didn't notice this. I got to yeah. pay better attention. <laughs> yeah, I? exactly. And so every every scene is we're starting over from scratch. Yeah. Even though the last scene ended with the king saying, "You are my number one." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I also, you know, we didn't mention it at the time, but I do love the fact that he's praying like eight feet from the king's tent and didn't yeah, realize yeah. that. That was great. Yeah. He's like, I got to look up more. When yeah, I'm right. God yeah, damn it. <laughs> I've been looking left this whole fucking time. Right <laughs> is where it was all happening. So, yeah. So, so, but this is where King Nebuchadnezzar makes a 90 foot golden statue of himself, which is totally not a drawing. It's glowing. So it can't be a drawing, <laughs> is it? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and he demands that everybody worship the uh, statue, but, Fucking Shadrach, Madrak, and Abdrak, or whatever, wouldn't do it. <laughs> oh, this is where I said the Gallagher looking guy, but no, it's Gallagher. It's um, Gallagher. Yeah. Oh, and it, it is so right that he plays the, the giddy little schoolyard snitch. Like, it, <laughs> yeah. That may be the right, the best casting in the movie now that I think about it, actually. <laughs> Well, it's funny because before I realized that this was Gallagher, I wrote in it. I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And why is he playing this part like it's a guest spot on Sesame Street? But now it all makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, now it's all coming together. But yeah, so th but they bring in the the three other guys and they're like, hey, these guys won't worship you. And he's like, throw them in the furnace. And they're like, well, we're not afraid of no furnace. Our God will protect us from a furnace. And he's like, all right, we'll make the furnace <laughs> seven times hotter <laughs> than, than fire. I feel like right. they're just more... I don't think they have the technology <laughs> fire. You want them extra melted? I don't know. Just turn yeah. the dial up seven more times. What are you, yeah. what, what's hard about this? Turn it all the way around. Yeah. We need Doc Brown here with his different colored logs to, <laughs> yeah. to throw into the fire. And then he throws them into the worst CGI <laughs> fire. Oh my God. It's yeah. so funny. This is my best worst. And I, I got to say, not only does the effect itself look idiotic, what we're seeing is sort of a foreground, uh, like a brick arch and then like these bad pretend flames happening and like three cardboard cutouts Just of a dudes. silhouette, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then another fire in front. And, so and then, and then the angel <laughs> appears 
and is 12 feet tall. He's a kaiju. Yeah. It's kaiju yeah. Jesus that appears behind him. I laugh for so fucking long. It's suddenly Hogwarts yearbook photo and Hagrid is standing behind Harry, Ron, and Abednego. <laughs> Also, I know it's a historical and not actually accurate to the Bible, but a lot of modern Christians tell this story as Jesus is the one who's in the fire yeah, with yeah. them. And, and I, I was really hoping that was going to be in this movie. Well, they definitely, that was definitely supposed to be Jesus. Right. You they, were they supposed to recognize silhouette. that as Jesus. They, they, yes. The silhouette, they, they blacked out the face so you couldn't see it because when you're in the middle of a fire, it casts shadows over your face. <laughs> That's what they um, say, yeah. And <laughs> But yeah, the... This is an annoying mistranslation that I always harp on about. The the King James Version says, the son of God. And for since the earliest Christianity, they've been like, well, that's, that must be Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> But the Aramaic says, a son of gods. And then later, Nebuchadnezzar says, oh, the, you're the, the messenger of the one true God came down. And, and uh, I was wondering what they were going to do with the movie, if they were going to say, the son of God. A son of God, whatever. And they and they kind of punted and went with an angel of God. Yeah. So they just replaced mm. it. I was like, boo. Yes, exactly. Pussy footing around it. Why don't you just say it's Jesus? That's yes, because if it's Jesus, then he gets to be like, hello, I, well, I'm very important way later. Later, um, later. Not now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all Remember I know, me for later. <laughs> all I know is that this movie has now convinced me and none of you will ever be able to change my mind that Jesus is Hagrid and that is how I will hear all the Sermon on the Mount forever is going to be blessed are the cheese the peacemaker. It's just going to be you're a wizard, Matthew. You're an apostle now, Matthew. Yes. If J.K. Rowling gets three more mean tweets, she might say that. Yeah, no, it's so, so, and I love throughout this whole scene because the graphics look like like if the if the four of us had to produce this graphic. You know, like in a, to defuse a bomb, quick before it, whatever, whatever. This is what we come up with. So because it's so bad, the way that the the, the movie tells us what's going on is we just watch Nebuchadnezzar tell us what he's looking at. He's like, "Why yeah. there's a fourth image in the fire? We threw only three men in. It's an angel of God." You know, because we couldn't <laughs> tell by just the graphic. <laughs> So, okay, so now they're back out of the furnace unharmed. Nebuchadnezzar's amazed. He's like, wow, you don't even smell like fire. I'm like, what a weird detail to put in that. <laughs> I don't know. I went camping like last week and I still, when I shower, smell smoke. So maybe yeah, that is no, the real miracle. Okay. You might be having a stroke in the shower, so... <laughs> And then he makes the funniest pronouncement, right? Because and yes. I thought this when we read this in the Bible too, when we read the Bible on our show, I thought it was so weird that he's like, oh, now I'm double impressed with the God. But he does this thing where he's like, all right, now anyone who talks shit about Jew God will be cut into, their words, not mine, little pieces. Yes. <laughs> and, and their house reduced to rubble will also cut your house into little pieces. <laughs> you got to wonder if there was someone in charge of those technicalities, right? Someone shows up with a body hacked into like five or six pieces and it's like, come on, Mitch. It's what a, a little, little piece. You heard what the right king said. <laughs> <laughs> and again, but that's the problem with with basing your story on not Bronze Age stories, older than Bronze Age story or younger than Bronze Age stories, but by up to six hundred <laughs> years, as I understand. Mm -hmm. But this is this is supposed to be a fucking triumph in the story, but it's the most barbaric shit you can imagine. So it doesn't exactly have the impact they're going for. Yeah, and then immediate once you hear scene, then everything goes back to Nebuchadnezzar being a pagan and Daniel living out back <laughs> in a shed. It, right. All right, well, not to put too fine a point on it, but the guy he was threatening to cut into little pieces, that was us, right? Uh, so we're going to take a quick <laughs> break and check the locks, but uh, we'll be back in a flash with even more of The Book of Daniel. Which is why I must cancel my subscription. Oh, perfect, Dan. They are going to love it. Hey, guys, what you doing? Yeah, Dan, are you okay? I'm totally fine. Eli here just hired me to use my acting skills to get him out of his subscriptions. Yeah, his performances are as moving as they are practical. Thank you, Eli. Guys, if you want to manage your subscriptions, why don't you just use Rocket Money? What's Rocket Money? 
Dan has a point now. He's our friend. Okay. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, I have full control over my subscriptions and a clear view of my expenses. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, Rocket Money can help me cancel it with a few taps. So no waiting on hold for hours? No waiting on hold. Rocket Money will even try to negotiate lower bills for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is submit a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. They'll deal with customer service for you. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. All right, Noah, I'm in. Where do I sign up? Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. That's rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. Rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. Awesome, Noah. Thanks. I still don't understand why you were covered in fake blood. Weren't you going to be on the phone? It's part of my process, Dan. Part of his process, obviously. <laughs> it's not fake blood. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the execution room. Nice. Oh, yeah. It's every it's very state of the art. This is the disemboweling table. Please make sure that you're scraping everything into the bin. Afterwards, that all has to go to the pigs. Sorry, you feed people to the pigs? Yeah, it's a, it's a king decree thing. Uh, hey, Chris, this is this is Frank. He's new. How's it going? Uh, Chris is the best little piece cutter in the business. So, sorry, little piece cutter? Oh, it's another king decree. Anyone who insults Jew God has to be cut into little pieces. That's how he worded it. Yeah, that feels open to interpretation, though, right? Uh, you'd think so, but no. Pretty much it has to be a brunoise. Wow, not even like a dice? No, nah, too uneven, man. Sure, sure. And over here is the lion's den. Uh, now, this is going to seem self-evident, but you got to you gotta hit a balance between feeding them enough to make them big and scary and making sure that they're hungry when we throw someone in there, right? Yeah, I've been here for like two days. Well, you know, I fed them right before I threw you in, didn't I, Michael? It's true, he did. What about a Julianne? Could Look, you do a Jul I don't tell you how to do your job. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action outside of the flashback with old Daniel kind of yada, yada, yada his way to the next dream interpretation story. I've never been mad at you for we're going to rejoin the action as an intro <laughs> to a segment of our podcast now. Fair, fair. Also, this is, this was one of those moments where Cyrus is telling us, he's, Cyrus starts to tell the story, but like mm -hmm. all I could hear, and this was one of those ADHD moments, all I could hear was this deep gravelly voice going, the shepherd, yes. baby. <laughs> I could not penetrate the droning. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's what's amazing is, of course, the the version of the the story of the legend of Cyrus's birth is very kind of familiar, and it's used in the Bible, and it's used in all kind of different places. It's just one of those Shakespeare sort of, steals steals. Yeah, it. right, right. It's just one of those sort of familiar tropes that you see all over the place. And so they stop, and Cyrus is like. Actually, I'd like to be the one telling the story now. And he tells that fucking story. <laughs> it's, so it's an interruption story, right? Yeah. He's like, and so I walked and you walked into the valley. Yeah, yeah. I can, <laughs> I'm an over five. You have to let me eat crafty. <laughs> right. Well, that's exactly what it was, right? Because the, the Lance Henriksen was like, no, uh, this this isn't all the lines I have. And they're like, no, not at all. <laughs> of course. Are you kidding? You yeah. got a lot of lines. And I think, again, it's an attempt to, one, try to break up the monotony of, of this freaking narrative from the book of Daniel, but also try to stitch it into a broader history, even as ahistorical as this legend is. Sure, yeah. They're trying to, they're trying to show, look, it's all interrelated. Right, right. No, you've heard this story in history, and now this yeah. story is also in history. Yeah, right, right. Also, it's a very sanitized version of the legend, right? Because at the end of this one, Cyrus's dad is just like, yeah, I'm sure glad that kid's okay. Right? That, ah, the, shucks. The version I heard was way more cannibalistic <laughs> than that. But, so, but then we, we flash back into Nebuchadnezzar having another bad dream. I love that what I've inflicted on Eli is a movie where people constantly talk about their dreams. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> if this had ended with a zip line race, this would not have been more directed at me as a human being. So, so yeah, so, but, but this time, I guess he doesn't make Danny guess his dream anymore. That's just a one-time thing. So he tells him about this dream where he dreamed of a tree 
And and it goes on for so fucking long because I guess they're quoting from the Bible at this point. But like we're all just going like, yeah, we get it, man. Tree stuff. Keep it well, just- except that he <laughs> introduces this like obviously he wakes up in a you know cold sweat and he introduces this as like this is the scariest dream I've ever had. Yeah, yeah. the images literally terrified me. That is a line from the movie. And then he tells a story about a tree getting cut down. And that's it. Yes. Yeah. This orange guy came out of the stump and he was like, the trees have no knees. And I speak for the trees. Started talking about climate change. Scared the crap out of me. <laughs> What's so funny is that they very clearly start to do the, we're going to illustrate his dream thing because they show us like another color. They invested in a third colored pencil drawing yeah, right. of this big, beautiful tree. And then he's like, and then an angel came down and said, make that tree tree's mind into an animal. <laughs> they just cut away. Yes, yeah. like, right. well, I don't know how to draw that. Cut we're not down the tree and he's like, oh, we, not, we don't have it. And, and hack up its limbs. Oh, we certainly don't have it. And make it have the mind of an animal. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody just sat around going, what the mind of an animal? Why would the tree can you even have the... I don't think you can animate that. You know, they had some, some undergraduate illustrator or whatever. They were like, can you do this? They're like, I can give you a tree. <laughs> I can do that. No, I've like, got right, tree. You already I mean, told us you couldn't do the statue because it was too many different colors. Fiverr is double our budget, so I guess we're going to take a trip. <laughs> right, but he wraps up the bad news, right? And he's like, yeah, so all this bad stuff, you're going to go crazy, you're going to eat grass like cattle until you worship Jew God. And I had always wondered why in the Bible he doesn't go like, so maybe skip all that and just, you know, worship Jew God. No. Right now, <laughs> <laughs> and in the movie he does. He's like, you want to, you want to skip that part? Yeah, this is a great <laughs> moment, right? Because he say he talks about this. The, the tree gets cut down, and the the stump itself gets chained to the earth or whatever. And then he's like, so what does it mean? And Danny's like, <laughs> what does it mean? This guy with the questions and stuff. Ah, <laughs> oh. I don't know. I feel like this was the easiest dream to interpret ever. I think even Gallagher could have gotten. This. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh no, you're a great tree, and then you get cut down. It's not, it's not hard, dude. No, this, this is a, it's actually pretty, pretty straightforward. Dream then there's some watermelons. They come out. <laughs> <laughs> but this is another part of the the book of Daniel that is just entirely ahistorical because this this idea about uh, the king who wanders off into the desert like a hippie for seven years that is Nabonidus, who was the last king of Babylon before it was conquered oh, yeah, right, by right. Cyrus the Great. Mm-hmm. And so the book of Daniel has, has erroneously attributed this to Nebuchadnezzar. And so this is another problem, only the, the movie doesn't, really, there's no way to, to make this right. So they just kind of lean into it. I'm like, okay, we'll just, we'll keep Nebuchadnezzar. So much ahistorical stuff in this yeah. book. So weird. <laughs> it's so weird, yeah. <laughs> you wrote the book for yourselves. You could have just- <laughs> It's your I, book. I, it's your book. So, but Nebuchadnezzar, like, he hears all of this stuff and he's like, oh, well, I'll be nice to poor people and shit. But that oh, that only lasts for about a year. Yeah. And then we get this great moment. So he's standing out at his palace and he's looking at his palace. Don't ask too many questions. They only have the <laughs> one line drawn. Oh, my God. That was the moment I was talking about where the voiceover <laughs> literally says they're walking on the roof of the palace and they look out over the land and they're in the picture that the only picture that they've ever used yes, is the, the fucking palace. palace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's chatting with eunuch Steve about how all, he's like, man, my stuff is awesome. I'm really the best. If you think about it, there's no one in the world any better than me. I'm amazing. And that's about all Yahweh is willing to listen to. <laughs> so we literally oh, so do funny. fucking boomy voice like we do in our goddamn sketches. I laughed for so long. <laughs> it was so bad. Because it's also, it's not biblical, this moment. So they just have God talking smack fancy. <laughs> right? It's like, fuck you, man. Come up here and say that. <laughs> <laughs> bitch ass bitch. <laughs> So yeah, but so God takes his authority and gives him, and they keep referring it to it to it as an animal brain. I, I have an animal brain. I don't know the fuck they mean. <laughs> they have okay, animal brain. I have a I have a theory, and I want to put this out there. I'm going to be radically vulnerable. I'm going to speak from my heart. This was a bet among the crew how many pieces of grass they could get this actor to put in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh no, we didn't get the take again, Chris. Do you mind going and putting that um? 
dandelion in your mouth. Yeah, that's perfect. We're gonna get a shot. You know what? Could you just take a whole big bite of dirt? It would. <laughs> it would actually really, look really good. Well, I, I also I want to point out that this actor clearly had a barefoot double, right? Because we keep seeing that he's barefoot and walking around, but never in the same shot that we see the actor's face, and we never when we see the actor's face, it's never below yeah. the waist. And he's like got got like half a toe. And yeah, uh, <laughs> they're they're angry feet that, yeah. that, that he's got. <laughs> And this was this was clearly filmed in the empty lot behind the studio. Oh yeah, they, oh, they were 100%, like, yeah. they're like fading out the corners, like get the in and out dumpsters out of the shot. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right, <laughs> right. There's a teamster taking a smoke break in the <laughs> shot. Yeah, they, they made a lot of use out of tight shots in this movie, yeah, yeah. didn't they? <laughs> I like that they what they say is that this is the most he's been doing this for seven years and he is literally crawling pain stricken on the ground. It's like, dude, he hasn't picked up even basic bushcraft by seven years. Right? <laughs> like he like we've all seen Castaway. We know what you can do after seven years of trying to figure right? it out. Yeah. yeah, and the and the flash out kind of addresses that, right? So we go to the old guys at the golf club, and they're like, "Wait, I'm sorry, he had the mind of an animal for seven years, and he didn't die." And he's like, "God told the animals to leave him alone." Yes, the lions <laughs> and bears do better than to fuck with him. Apparently, <laughs> just two hyenas sitting on a cliff. So you're sure God said that yeah, guy? No, that like, guy. Just, yeah. He I was very guy. specific. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we Jewish? <laughs> But yeah, but one day Daniel decided that he had had enough and he wanted to acknowledge that that God had fucking a, a, more fucking Transformers than him or whatever this was all about, right? Which, of course, you have to stop and think, well, wait, if he had the mind of an animal, how was that mind capable of deciding to praise Yahweh? Right? <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. Yeah, because it implies that he was roaming around the desert for six and a half years being like, this is bad, but I don't want to like give it all up to Jew God yet. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Right. Right. <laughs> right. But then he's like, I, I, uncle, uncle, whatever, man, uncle. <laughs> and boomy voice, God comes in and he goes, all right, I'm done. I'm going to go back to being a king now. You're good. <laughs> and apparently they just saved his place. Yes. Like nobody, like right. there was no, mm -hmm. nobody stepped in or like there was no coup attempts or anything. They were just, oh, good, you're back. Okay. Well, yeah. here's some, here's a list of things that we needed to get done. A lot of paperwork that yeah. hasn't been getting done. Yeah. Cyrus would just be like, oh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's not able to join us this week. And you know, <laughs> yeah. you see a comment on Patreon, man. It's fine. Bring the dance on. Well, historically, again, this is, this is Nabonidus who runs off into the desert and he leaves his son Belshazzar as his regent who is, is ruling in his state. And so there's there are a lot of people who try to argue that that this is historical because Belshazzar is represented in Daniel as the last king of Babylon, and they're like, so well, well, Nabonidus was gone, Belshazzar was the king, and um, like they, but he wasn't recognized as the king. They didn't hold the Akitu festival because the king wasn't in town. Bunch of crap like that. But the whole animal mind thing is kind of reflects this idea that we see in Numbers 22. Don't know if you remember the story of. Balaam being hired by Balak to go curse the Israelites. At one point, he's riding his donkey and the angel of the Lord appears in the way and the donkey tries to walk around, but he kind of traps him. But Balaam can't see him. And then he's like kicking the, and whipping the donkey. And finally, the donkey starts talking to him. Yeah, we remember the talking I, I, donkey. I remember okay. the start with the, like, I don't know if you remember this one. This is a little talking <laughs> donkey in the book. Is, but, yeah, but, we, no, yeah. yeah. But and the, and the whole point of this is it's kind of rhetorically suggesting that even that, that Balaam is dumber than the ass that he's riding on. Because even the ass can see the angel and understands what's going on. And so Balaam has to have this explained to him by an animal. And so the idea with Nebuchadnezzar is he's got to revert to this kind of primordial animalistic state because even a basic animal can tell that God is, you know, in charge. So he was being upgraded. Yeah. 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 It's basically, okay. this is, we're doing a factory reset. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <Exactly. you're, laughs> then you're going to get all the updates. All right. No, that makes sense. Do you think the donkey first read numbers when it came out, like hot off the presses and was like, oh shit, now it it makes it like like I'm an asshole. I like to talk. Oh. So, I hope Dan defends me on a podcast someday. <laughs> all I'm going to say, here's the other thing though. When Nebuchadnezzar gets back to court after all of this, mm -hmm. we know that he is really, like his mind has genuinely changed because he upgraded hats. 
Oh, he did. Yeah, yeah. He, he went with the. Yeah, he, he literally went, he, gives a little. I'm so changed for my semester abroad speech. <laughs> 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 Are you going to start pronouncing it mozzarella now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he's on it, but he's on Team Yahweh now. He's not Jewish. He just he likes. He thinks that's a pretty cool guy as far as gods go. So then the voiceover k- kicks in to sort of wrap up ne- Nebuchadnezzar's part of the story. He's like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so he dies, and he starts to tell the next part of the story. And I love this because Bishop Cyrus cuts in and he's like. Hey man, you're talking about the the part where like Babylon was overthrown. I was there. Like I know right. this one. <laughs> that right? one was me. Like I was I did that. Don't quote the deep magic to me, Winch. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that they cling to the age-old god-awful movie adage of tell don't show. Yeah. <laughs> because Truly. this guy sits there and literally describes by far the most cinematic moment this movie has to offer and they never do it. No. Like he just says it. That's an expensive scene to shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. Right. No, he's talking about the siege of Babylon and how they overcame yeah. it by diverting the river and everything like that. And he's like, yeah, no, I was just going to get to that. But why don't you tell, you just tell this part of the story. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> and the, the thing that annoyed me the most is Daniel says this was prophesized, mm. which is not a word. Mm-hmm. No. It's just prophesied. Dan McClellan. I do not think you're allowed to decree anything is not a word. <laughs> I don't think you, of all people, who literally won't allow anyone to say anything about language, just, or, like, you refuse to let me use a dictionary. You're not allowed to say that's not a word. Hey, there are degrees of of acceptability here. But yeah, no, there's, there's an ongoing Scrabble feud in the data yes. over dogma household. I, I, I am adopting a prescriptivist outlook for the sake, for the sake of, of facetiousness, for comedy. Okay. Yes. I didn't realize you were that kind of doctor. Can I get some Zannies? I was no, love no, no. He said he's going to do prescriptions. So now is the, now is the time for the story of the second king, right? This is Belshazzar, king of Babylon. We get the big title card, second king. And we meet Belshazzar at a big party. And I got so excited when I realized where in the book we were. I know. (laughs) I'm so excited. I was like, ghost, hand, ghost, hand, (laughs) ghost, hand. Well, because this is like, it's one of those things where like, you can just have Cyrus go, yeah, you know, it was a big siege and we blah, blah, blah. But you have to actually do the ghost hand. So yeah, got really excited. So they're at this big party. It's it's a lot of tight shots, but trust us, it's a very big party. They're in a very large room. You, <laughs> you don't know it. It's from Canada. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but and, and Belshazzar, he's not worried about this siege beyond the city walls. He knows that he's going to be just fine. He just wants to celebrate. The only problem is that he doesn't have good enough cups. <laughs> His cups taste bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I love the moment. When one of his advisors, low rent Sir Davos from Game of Thrones, with, <laughs> he has the weirdest accent. I went back and watched it like three times. I don't know why yes. he has an accent. What I was ass- he even trying for there? I assumed that he was actually like a foreign dude. I don't know. I didn't look it up, but he was like, my king, these three, these cups are considered sacred. <laughs> I was like, what? What is that? I yeah, it's like he's trying to start a fight with a French guy he hasn't met before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 Monsieur King. <laughs> <laughs> also, it's it's just a beautiful moment of a biblicality where he's like, "Bring me the cups," and then they keep the camera rolling while he turns to like the slave who's been stroking his arm. And he's like, "I'm sorry, I yelled about the chew cups. I just I'm, I'm like really stressed right now, and I'm trying to keep harder boundaries in my life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're but a slave." <laughs> he makes it very clear that he's not worried about Jew God. He'll drink out of whatever fucking cup he wants. So then we get to see the cheap ass shitty fucking cups, the dollar store cups with this nine dollar budget movie spray painted gold. Yeah. So they bring out these cups. It looks like something you'd serve a Sunday in at the Cheesecake Factory. Yeah, it's got it's got real King Arthur school play vibes. These cups, yes. <laughs> right? But they fill him with wine, and he raises his glass for a toast to Marduk. And all the other gods, right? Marduk yeah. still gets a mention. I would have been so pissed off if I was another god, if I had just been a fucking and a special thanks yeah. in the god, in the god <laughs> ceremony. I'm the et cetera? Fuck you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the et al of the academic yes, world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then, so they all start drinking from their cups. And then we get what I would have expected if 
like we were watching a Twilight Zone episode from 1962 or something like that for this. Oh, you think it was that? Good? You were worried that it was going to be that good quality. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the ghost hand comes in, starts writing really slowly. Yeah, <laughs> I think they could have got a little bit quicker with that. It's like Microsoft Paint font. Too, <laughs> yes. They were just so funny, and they couldn't they couldn't write it in the Aramaic script. They had to be like, well, it's got to be in English. No, so they that. wrote it in English in spook. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yes, <but> in, <laughs> which means that God was like, I'm going to write it, and I'm going to write it in spooky font. <laughs> right, right. He's like, you know, we did Comic Sans once before. That did not go over well. So uh, <laughs> let's do some. I will say this though. It's a here's a fun tip for your next party. When things are getting a little stale or, you know, maybe you've made everyone uncomfortable by throwing a fit about cups, mm -hmm. have a ghost hand write a riddle on a wall. It'll change the whole vibe. Oh, yeah. 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 Everybody will forget. Well, what I love the most about this is that the ghost hand is four letters in. It is written M-E-N-E. -E, and Belshazzar turns to everybody and says, whoever shall be able to read this gets to be the vice <laughs> right. president yeah. of Babylon and has all my... Right. I feel like you'd exhaust just waiting till it was done first. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Let him finish. Come on, man. It, it did take a long time. I was like, are they just going to kind of sit there? And one guy's like, <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> kind of waiting. Okay, we see that word. Oh, it's the same word again. Are they going to do the same word a oh, third no, it's time? A oh, it's a different it's, word. It's, okay. Someone and, move the planchette to the goodbye part. I want a different <laughs> one. <laughs> also, I just have to point this out because like they take lots of liberty with biblical language. So I don't know why they felt the need to use the I will dress him in purple catchphrase, right? Because what that means, and Dr. Dan, I'm sure you can say what that actually means, but like what that means is he's going to be part of my royal court. But in Instead, he stands up and declares, I will dress him in purple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I what I think it was, I think it was Belshazzar. At one point he said, again, language thing annoys me. He says, from whence it came. And whence means from where. <laughs> so just so you're aware, you don't say from whence, you just say whence it came. From right. where it's like ATM whence machine. Yeah, right. right yeah. <laughs> the Los Angeles Angels. I do I do love that, like, and this is biblical. I love that this is uh that the hand writes gibberish words that aren't like real words even for them. Because again, this is Daniel able to do the easy trick where any interpretation is right. Like, I can tell you what those words mean. <laughs> well, they, like, they, it translates to, like, number, number, weight, measure, right? Or something like that. It, yeah, like, weight, weight, number, measure. Okay, um, yeah. It's, so, it is Aramaic. Oh, okay. Like, he would have he spoken Aramaic. The whole reason <laughs> that Judaism adopted Aramaic is because they were in the exile in Babylon, where Aramaic was the language of wider communication. So, yeah, the, like... They should have been able to read this. But that's what's in the biblical text. So, really weird that he would have had to go to like give me a give somebody a half of my kingdom or whatever to read it at yeah. that point. But it would be great as if he just came in there and he's like, wait, wait, number measure, and then took the gold chain and the fucking purple <laughs> right. robe yeah. and left or whatever. <laughs> but, he, but he tells him, like, oh, that means that uh, God's done with your bullshit. You used this cup, so now the Medes and the Persians are gonna take over your city. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I feel like this king is really dumb. Because I don't care what the actual truth is. If a guy interprets your thing and he tells you that you're doomed, you obviously kill that guy and find somebody to do a better one. Like, that's just how you do it. Or you just keep drinking. Like, what are you doing? Why did you just let, you know, just it's so funny. believe that he's right? And then reward him. Yes, when he actually does it, right? So they, they, he calls the guy in and he's like, oh, God's going to punish you. Like, no, it's just saying, right? God's going to yeah. punish you. He's no, so you're going to die tonight. Right, you're going <laughs> to die tonight. And then we watch this actor be like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> give this guy a prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, okay. But we cannot brush past the fucking actual reveal when he, when he goes to like actually tell him what it all means. Oh, you mean the dramatic prairie dog sound? It's legitimately the dramatic prairie dog sound, dude. And what, there's a gong in one of them? Scun okay. dun. I wrote this down, and podcast listener, I need you to know that I am not exaggerating. As he reads the words, which they can all read because they're in spooky English, he says, meanie, dramatic prairie dog sound. Oh, my God. Tackle, horror house scream. Yes, and a thunderclap. <laughs> Upfrasian, 
Dramatic prairie dog sound again. I when the dramatic prairie dog sound came back a second time, I was crying with laughter. I was weeping with laughter in front of my computer. It was so fucking over the top. That's when I went and wrote a sarcastic sound effects guy as my best worst is when we reach this point in the fucking film. There's one that's even better later. But yeah, but what I love the most about this is that, you know, he says when he comes in, he's like, hey, man, can you tell me what this means? And Daniel takes a look at it. And he's like, you sure you want me to tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? He's like, I can take it. I can take it. Tell me the truth. But then he doesn't just tell him what it means. He tells him all of that shit, like in the form of a Tom roast. <laughs> right? Like the whole time he's doing it, he's like, and you also were a fucking piece of shit about God's sippy cups and he's mad about that still now and everything else. He just goes on and on for the, the point where the king's like, okay, I get it. I'm going to die, man. Like that's, <laughs> you, that's all you had to say. Right? Some of your high school friends are still in touch with each other. They choose <laughs> not to reach out to you. <laughs> <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> And again, it's a situation where he's like, well, that sucks. Uh, anyway, put him in charge of the kingdom, I right, guess. Right, yes. <laughs> and <like> then <laughs> as soon as that's over, Daniel is relegated to the outhouse out back again. Right, yeah. He's walking around to the in and out dumpster some more. Yeah. No, he goes, is there, is there nothing to be done? And Daniel's like, well, you, you, you need to give me a purple robe and a necklace or something. I think that was... <laughs> I, was I believe that there was a, a necklace involved. <laughs> yes, yes, right, right, right. <laughs> And then in that moment, I love this so much. Just then, all the soldiers break in and the, the, the city is fallen. I like that they yell the name of their king when they break in. Yeah, right. Right, right. It kind of ruins the surprise. I want one guy to do it early. All hail. Shh, fuck. God damn it. It's like the guy who claps too early at the concert with the orchestra. <laughs> And this this is another part where the movie's trying to apologize for the book. Yes. Because he has uh, Darius come in and he's like, King Darius, you know who I am. Anyway, uh, I'm uh, taking the city in my name as Cyrus, who is actually the king, commanded me. Just so we're clear we about we're both who's in king. charge. I'll be yeah. the king later. Because <laughs> Cyrus explains that he's the one who took the city, which is what historically happened. And uh, Darius was 11 years old when yeah. all of this went down. <laughs> okay. So the real so Darius the Great ruled after Cyrus's son, where he took over the kingdom from Cyrus's son. So, yeah. Right. Well, unless you count Galmata the, the Magus, the, he had a little short reign there in between. But yes. Yeah. But we don't count that. Oh, okay. And can I, can I say, <laughs> can I say, if there had been a fifth grader in the last third of this movie, it would have been way funny. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just I just like that, like the the moment that you're talking about, Dan, sets up the weirdest thing, which is Darius comes on and says something along the lines of send word to Cyrus that I, Darius, his uncle and father-in-law, <laughs> have taken the towns and am now going to be king of it as he insisted. Yes. Now you there. Do you know who I am? You just said. <laughs> and Daniel's like, uh, I think you're Darius. The, yeah, you just the said who uncle you were. And the nephew and son-in-law of Cyrus. <laughs> who was this. And then he's like, oh my God, you're a prophet. How did you know? <laughs> I like the cut of your jib. Yeah. Put him in charge of everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. Yeah, so yeah, they, they stab Belshazzar the fucking, the moment where fucking Darius of Iowa State stabs Belshazzar is just <laughs> priceless. And then Daniel's just standing there in the back, all awkward, like he just showed his tits at Mardi Gras with that ridiculous bling necklace that they've given him. <laughs> then, 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 of course, this is where Darius Ted cruises him, right? He does the whole do you know who I am thing. But he does. Apparently, he's the third king. They sneak the title card in on us right here. This is going to ruin the tour. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so, but Daniel is like, hey, you know what? Uh, you're the new king. I saw you stab the other guy. So uh, I'm on your <laughs> side. Always liked you better. I'll hail you, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, this? I actually just got it. Yes. For telling him he was going to, do you like it? Just, I'm just trying something new. Yeah. It does feel, it does feel very much like that was like a, a god. You're on Yahweh punk. Yeah, right, exactly. right, right, yeah. Where it's like, oh, I just got this awesome new robe and check out these this bling and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, hey, you there, rich Babylonian dude. I, I'm killing all of them. Ah, oh, you oh. got me again. <laughs> this is how Uncle Dan and I tried out our COVID beards on each other. Just getting on Zoom. <laughs> what do you think? Is it nice? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
I just got it. It's a purple robe. The king gave it to me. And there, there's another thing that the movie is trying to do here to, to gloss over something that Christians do here by combining Darius and, and Cyrus, saying they're, they're in league with each other. They're trying to mush together the notion that's presented in Daniel that there was a Median kingdom and then the Persian kingdom. And so when we go back to our statue, if you combine the Medes and the Persians are supposed to be two, two different parts of that statue, which means that Alexander the Great and then the Diadochi, the um, successors, are the rest of the statue because this book was finalized in the 160s BCE, right when uh, the battles for succession are going on. But if you squish the Medes and the Persians together, you can move everything up one, and then it's uh, Greece and then Rome, and then the toes get to be any modern kingdom. And oh. so that's how you that's how you make the prophecy extend all the way down to today is by squishing together the Medes and the Persians. That gives you a little more room to work with. Oh, so that's really interesting. This is both trying to make it seem more historical and also trying to allow you to misinterpret the vision of the statue so that it can be made to be Joe a Biden. prophecy oh. about right. today. I, I right. thought yeah, Joe yeah. Biden's feet were looking a right. little Right, yeah, clay-like. exactly. Oh, that's, that's really cool. <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, but but so he decides he's going to be on uh, Team Darius from now on, so that's settled. And then we back out of the flashback a little bit to meet Lance Henriksen's screen time minimum. <laughs> and he, this is where he goes they, again. They're they're trying to retcon the history of this. He goes, Ah, Darius, he's my uncle and my uncle. Our family actually has more incest than Heath's search history, but uh, it's um, <laughs> don't Google it. Yeah. Don't Google it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. He goes, eventually, Darius put me in charge of the whole kingdom because of my wisdom. And he's like, hadn't you already been in charge of the whole kingdom twice? Did he's like, you tell Darius sh- what to do? Sh- <laughs> uh, <laughs> what was Darius doing if you were in charge of the whole kingdom? He was uncling. Uh, the great, the great <laughs> king. But this is where, where they decided to put him in charge of everything. This is where all the other advisors got super jealous and decided that they were going to have to take Daniel out. Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, all right. Or boy, oh, 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 yeah, right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> to fit this movie. Film. All right, so I'll tell you what. Well, if, if we ignore the fact that we've already read the book and the movie has already spoiled how this is going to go, we have tension, damn it. So that means we get to take a break. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Does this movie have lion money? Did they blow their budget on Bishop? Would actorless B-roll of lions very much in a zoo enclosure do in a pinch? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the Leonine conclusion of The Book of Daniel. This podcast is sponsored by Naked Wines. Eli, please don't do this. Shh, shh, they're, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Hey, Eli, nice smoking jacket. Oh, <laughs> this old thing? Why, yes, uh, you haven't heard? I'm smart now. He's wearing it backwards. Okay, Eli, I'll bite. Why are you smart now? Because of Naked Wines, of course. What is Naked Wines? I saw you avoid the point. You're still our friend. Naked Wines is a subscription service that seamlessly connects you to the finest independent winemakers on the planet. So you get a box of the market's best quality wines, however often you'd like, for a fraction of the price you'd normally pay in stores. Use our code AWFUL for the code and password at NakedWines.com and get their incredible deal of six bottles for just $39.99. It's true. Naked Wines sent us a box to try when they became a sponsor, and the Cabernet they sent us was earthy and aromatic without being overpowering. I'm told, because Heath took all of it. But I don't understand how you can afford amazing wines at those prices. Dan, you fool. Naked Wines connects winemakers and wine drinkers directly, allowing for vineyard-to-your-door delivery at up to 60% off what you would pay in store. By cutting out the traditional retail middleman costs, winemakers can pass those savings on hundreds of top-quality, award-winning wines to you, without skimping on quality, like my silken smoking jacket. It has Betty Boop on it. But the wine does sound amazing. Where can I sign up? Head to nakedwines.com slash awful and click enter voucher in the top right and put in awful for both the code and password to get six bottles of wine for just $39.99 with shipping included. That's $100 off and less than $7 per bottle. That's nakedwines.com slash awful and use the code and password awful and grab six bottles for just $39.99. One last time, that's nakedwines.com slash awful. Code and password awful for $100 off your first six bottles. Nice, Eli. Thanks. I guess you could say I'm an Ivy League man myself now. 
Oh, because grapes grow on vines. Grapes grow on vines, exactly. Did we miss it? No, you guys are just in time. The king is about to do the toast. I'm Marduk, by the way. A horse god. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm one of the lower river gods. And now I'd like to offer a toast to Marduk. Oh, that's you. That's you. So nice of them. The god of our lands. Oh, awesome. Really good for you. And also the other gods. Wait, what? I mean, maybe he's going to come back to us. Now for the celebration, let us take these cups. Oh, you have got to be fucking kidding me. And also the other gods, seriously? I am so sorry, you guys. No, no, you know what? This isn't on you, Marduk. This is so classically him. Just like everyone remembers the big four or five gods and the little guys like us just go unnoticed. God, they use horses for literally everything. Really sucks. You know what? We're... We're just going to go. We're going to go. Come on, horse god. Yeah, let's get out of here. Hey, guys, what did I miss? Did anyone mention any gods that aren't me? Oh, not now, Jew god. Whoa. What's up with him? Horses. Horses. Sure. <laughs> I love that so much. And we're back for still more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the whatever you call more? this stuff. Uh, with <laughs> yeah, exactly. Half an hour more with three evil advisors and their clandestine meeting in the swamp. <laughs> oh, and we get my favorite character in the whole movie, which is Fly Guy. <laughs> I, yes, this guy. One of the three. He's the latest comer to this meeting, and he he is swatting away flies the whole time. I. For whatever reason, I loved this guy. Oh, he was sassy. <laughs> well, yeah, he was sad and he was so depressed and sad and just dejected, <laughs> right? Because they're all like, well, what if we killed Daniel? And he's like, nobody would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> what? What wouldn't believe what that he's dead? They're like, we could drown him. He's like, no, it would never work. I'm like, oh, okay, no, he could breathe underwater. <laughs> All right, fucking Eeyore, what are you doing here? <laughs> I, I love that he showed up late to their little their little clandestine meeting, and they're like, were you followed? Yeah, there was a red Volkswagen behind me for a few blocks, but I ditched him. What are you talking about? Where you follow? We could just look around ourselves. I can see a hundred miles in every direction, dude. I, I'm pretty sure I'm fine. Yeah, Don't that, pan. There's a Home Depot over there. Yeah, right. right yeah, exactly. Yeah. The family the in, the, in, the, in and out is watching us. Yeah. But other than that, not, I'm, I'm also going to point out that they walked, you know, whatever five miles to have this conversation away from prying ears and they're still fucking whispering. Yes. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? And I love the, the swatting of the floods. You know, this guy was like, I, this is my moment. I'm going to take yes. advantage of my screen time. The director's like, will you just say the damn lines? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He clearly was like, you wait, wait till they see this. Wait till they see this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they're all complaining because Daniel is so damn moral and he won't even take bribes and he's so loyal to his God. And one of them's like, hey, maybe we could use that as his weakness, right? Like like a jujitsu, right? Ah, uh. nothing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but they but they're like, oh, that that actually that works. We could make it illegal to pray to his God and then he'd have to do it because he's so loyal to his God. And then he'd be a criminal and we could have him put to death. This is what they decided because drowning is something that would be too complicated. Because no one would believe that he was possible of drowning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I, I love the first thing I thought of when these three guys sat down is, again, they took a Norelco to those beards. They yep. came down nice. It's like a number two. It's pretty close. And then they even got a bit of a fade going on the, uh, yeah, on the hair. Yeah, there's a youth faster look going. Yeah. Yeah. It's like these... <laughs> They couldn't be like, hey, we need you to grow your hair out for six months. It's like, no, no, we need this on DVD in six months. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. start filming yesterday. I don't think you can ask anyone in this movie to like do something for you. For I think, six I, I, months. I, I, yeah. Right. They're, they're, not, they're not paying anybody enough to like not to literally do <laughs> Can you anything. Take off right. your watch. Yeah. No, least. yeah. The the <laughs> ask is being in this movie. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I just, I love the, the thought of imagining Daniel telling the story to Cyrus. Yes! And so w- one of them <laughs> said, he's the most righteous guy ever. No one would ever believe that he did this. And then the other guy was like, yeah, he's so righteous. No one would believe that. And Cyrus is like, um, kill him. <laughs> yes! <laughs> this guy is really pissing me off. Right. So so we back out of the flashback and, and Bishop's like, Cyrus is like, yeah, well, you know, you're you're clearly a, a, the best. Obviously, if all of your enemies sit around talking about how great you are, and I'm like, dude, he's the one telling you the fucking yeah, story, right? You, like, the, the, you know, I I can tell you that the Pope has a lot of great stuff to say about me. I can, doesn't matter, but yeah, but they back in the in the flashback, they convinced the king to make it illegal to pray to the old gods, right? Mm. This is king. This is are we still on Belshazzar? No, we're on the, we're on Darius at this point, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they convinced Darius to make it illegal to pray. They're like, hey, you know, a lot of people are praying to the old gods to spite you. And he's like, they are. And he's like, yeah, so make it illegal to pray to all gods for 30 days. And he's like, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> you have something for me to sign. And they're like, yes, we literally we actually do a goddamn paper for you to goddamn sign. <laughs> no, Dr. Dan, Dr. Dan, did they? <laughs> Is that how they did most paperwork back then? Is they had big. Hunks of stone that they oh, would cart gosh. around like no, interns at the White House. <laughs> it's polystyrene. Uh, oh yes, my gosh. Yes, obviously. <laughs> Otherwise, his wrist would break from the way he was fucking holding yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's an inch thick at least. It's, yeah, yes. and then they it's don't. Insane. And they didn't. They they're not incising anything. They're like painting totally right. meaningless symbols, <laughs> gigantic symbols. By the way, you've got enough for maybe three words on each gigantic <laughs> yes. stone block. It's like this is. No, somebody at some point must have been like, well, what do they look like? And they're like, look, the brief says stone tablets with ancient writing on it. Make something up. Amazing. <laughs> if only the Babylonians had some type of distinctive writing that we could recreate yeah, yeah. on stone tablets. <laughs> yeah, the reality would have been they, they would have used somewhat wet clay with a stylus and would have impressed uh, their cuneiform uh, writing in here. And, and this doesn't... This doesn't remotely resemble Aramaic or Akkadian or Old Persian or anything like oh, that. Those languages weren't a series of triangles facing different directions? <laughs> no, and they works? did not have lines separating the different columns. So yeah, <laughs> right, right, where you can still see where the fucking artists try to create margins for their fucking <laughs> yeah, Sharpie right, yeah. letters and shit. It was God. And and also, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, Dr. Dan, but I also don't think that when they were done with the cuneiform tablet, they had the fucking king cuneiform sign the damn thing so <laughs> yeah. That it was official. <laughs> oh, do you think that ancient Babylonians complained about cuneiform the way we complain about cursive, right? Like you're signing a contract where like actually you have to do it in cuneiform. Oh, God damn it. Oh, I haven't done cuneiform since I was in like fifth grade. Why do they teach so, that in school? <laughs> it makes no sense. So and then so the bad guys come in, of course, immediately after that, they catch Daniel praying, which was the point the whole time. I mean, wait a minute. Do they though? Because A, he's praying. But then we hear this loud knocking on Smash Cut to a curtain <laughs> where they all come marging, barging well, through. Well, no, the, the door's down the ha- <laughs> the door's down the hallway a little bit. And they're he's bar- got- as they're barging in, like before they've had a chance to see him at all, they're like, ha! We caught, caught you! Ya. Yes! Yeah! He's like, I was just masturbating. And they're like, damn it! <laughs> damn it! Dang it. Were you masturbating to other gods? <laughs> <laughs> what, were you, what were you thinking about so yeah, so but but he was they, so they catch him. They're like, oh, we got him. So they come back to Darius to tell him that they caught Daniel praying. They're like, hey man, we got somebody defying your order already, and and he's like, oh wow. And then they bring Daniel in in ye olde handcuffs. Yeah. <laughs> can, can I just pause and just reflect a little bit on the dude who's conferring with Darius at the top of this scene, <laughs> yeah, with this little, who this has paperwork? a four foot long like thick flowing beard, but only from his jaw and below (laughs) and then up on his, like uh, anything above his jawline is just the patchiest stubble on his cheeks. It was the weirdest beard I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, he got a hair transplant from ZZ Top after the fire. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) but he could only afford like literally under the chin. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Giving up the whole thing, yeah. So, but they walk, they bring him in and they think he's been praying and Darius is pissed, right? Because he doesn't want to have to have Daniel fed, fed to the lions. But according to the rules on the box top, he has to, right? Now, 
again, Dr. Dan, I just want you to chime in here. <laughs> what, did did ancient Babylon work on Wishmaster rules? Right? <laughs> if you got the king of Babylon to say his name backwards, did he have to go back to his own dimension and leave Superman alone? Is that how it worked? <laughs> yeah, that. so it's not uh, Mixes Patok rules in uh, ancient Persia, but th- this is what the text says. They ha- They come in and say, recall, O king, that it is a law the me- of the Medes and the Persians that no edict or decree that the king issues can be changed. So they're asserting that, but yeah, this is this is nonsensical. The guy ran the world. He would <laughs> yeah. have been like, kill him and kill them too. And yeah. yeah, I get that. Anybody uh, else want to question me? Because yeah. <laughs> I'm just handing out killings. <laughs> yeah, because according to this movie, the king of Babylon felt really strictly held by no backseat. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, right. So he's like, oh, man, I would love to help you out, Daniel, but fucking no backsies. I mean, obviously, (laughs) I have to feed you to the lions now. And he's like, well, maybe that maybe we can go over the paperwork. Maybe we can find a loophole in my divine goddamn authority as as a living God. Yeah. And figure out a way to get you out of this. So we get them looking over the fucking paperwork and this them searching through the law books may be the funniest thing I've ever seen in my fucking life yes because uh, yeah. right? they're they're all they're just looking through these paper mache tablets with again like three words worth of shit written on so each they're fucking stacked one to the ceiling yes. right yeah. <laughs> exactly. someone's carrying a, a fucking wagon out this is just the Grubhub order guys I'll be back in a second for more <laughs> why did you have to hold the mail <laughs> bring forth another another truckload of styrofoam we need to find this <laughs> What what's really cool about this is one of the reasons that we have a ton of texts is because they did stash these little uh, clay tablets away in in libraries, and so they were like stacked to the ceiling all around, just thousands of them. And when thing when cities were overthrown, when they were destroyed, there would be this big conflagration or fire, and they would set buildings on fire, and that would bake the clay tablets. Oh, interesting. And so we have thousands of these texts precisely because somebody burnt down a library and we were able to dig up the now basically lasting forever clay tablets with the cuneiform writing on them. With with five words on each. Yeah. <laughs> and then one asshole in Alexandria was like, you guys know paper's a lot thinner. It's actually right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My paper seems pretty fucking stupid. Now, only they, they listen to Dr. Dan. And if you and if you ever get a hold of these tablets, like some of them are really small. They can be like one inch by one inch with several lines of writing on them. So when people, when they're like, paint it real big, um, that's... <laughs> Just 100% fake. Oh, right on. Okay, to be fair, the only thing that would have been funnier than the giant fake cuneiform yeah, tablets it would be tiny. is if he had been taking <laughs> notes on a one-inch by one-inch yeah. piece of clay, <laughs> glaring into the camera. Dr. Dan says this is what we wrote on. <laughs> so okay, but they can't find an excuse to not throw him to the line. So the time comes. Daniel's like walking him. He uh, Daniel hands Darius the, the bling right before they head to the lion's den Mm -hmm. and they walk to the dungeon together as friends. Yeah. (laughs) This is my favorite. This dungeon, apparently the lion's den is just in the basement, which I think is amazing. It's just a room in the basement. Yep. Did they even descend? Because it felt to me like they just went around the corner and down the hallway. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And in, and in the text, it says there was a stone that was placed over the opening to the den and in the movie, it's like, here, let me get the keys, clang, clang. Yes. And, it's, and it's this big panel door with a window with prison bars yes, in it. Yes, it's got little prison <laughs> like bars in it. So that the lions don't reach through and unlock <laughs> yeah. it. A door which they throw open and then leave open while Daniel gives his goodbyes to yes, everybody. Yes, right, yeah. with the hungry lions in it. I yeah. wanted a lion to jump out during his monologue so far. Oh, my bad. God. <laughs> I literally, like, nobody even, like, looks through the bars to be like, are the lions looking at the door right now? <laughs> right, or? right. Yeah, but they have a, he brought some uh, some kosher wine for Daniel, the Darius did. Mm-hmm. Right? So they have some wine, big pre-lion hug, <laughs> and uh, he goes in, and, and Daniel is like, hey, you never know, God might save me from the lions. And he's like, well, I won't know, because despite there being a... A window here. I'm just going to fucking leave, bud. <laughs> I'm going to go because it's yucky. It's gross. <laughs> it's not fun. And and this is what I started writing in my notes. Like, what are they going to do here? Because there is no fucking way that this movie has lion money. 
Right. And if they put an actor, if this movie put an actor in a room with a lion, I wouldn't trust him. I would feel really bad for that fucking <laughs> no actor. fucking shot. And it starts with like you see Daniel standing in the room and there's like a silhouette that kind of wanders by. Yes. It's like that. That's a dog. <laughs> with right. With a worse perspective or something. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so what are they going to do when you have to show a lion? <laughs> I, here's what you do. You call Joe Exotic and you say, hey, <laughs> if I send you a green screen and an iPhone 6, could you get us some growling lion footage? And a reach around. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, no, so they've got these They've got these lion shots. There's three lions, right? Two, two males and a, and a female. Which, by the way, if you know anything about lions... Two males and a female is exactly the right configuration. Right. Nothing bad could happen. <laughs> yeah, it goes yeah. It goes Two great. males and one female into the same enclosure. I really wanted a shot of them trying to introduce the, like they put the one lion in the other room and then this lion in that room. <laughs> Got to let them get used to each other's <laughs> smell. <laughs> yeah, smell under the door, yeah. And the bee footage they have bought of these lions. Because here's the thing. If you know anything about lions, they're big cats. And I don't know if you've ever met a cat before, but cats are fucking adorable. They do cat shit. They roll around <laughs> on their backs. They scratch their tummies. They bat gently at objects around them. And lions do that too. It requires a tremendous amount of training and camera artistry to make lions look scary. That is not what they nope. have done with the lions in this movie. <laughs> These fucking lions binky. might as well be chasing around a laser, right? <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love this scene. At one point, like the lion does lay on its back and ask for belly rubs. It's yes. so good. <laughs> There's literally a belly rubs moment and we're supposed to be like, is God going to give belly rubs? Yes. <laughs> I, I like that, Eli, you said, you know, if you know anything about lions, you know who didn't know anything about lions? Whoever wrote this script. Because at one point when Daniel is praying to be saved, he's like, I'm this beast whose teeth are like spears. And whose tongues are as sharp as swords. I don't think their tongues are sharp. I don't think that's what how What the fuck it are you talking <laughs> Like they're saying it's, mean things to you? like they're gritty. You know, after enough licking, it hurts. But Sure, yeah. No, it's like sandpapery, yeah. I feel like he was saying like they're kind of bitchy. Like <laughs> oh, okay, right, right. They have a sharp tongue. Why are you being mean, lion? Very Just witty, say those nice lions. things. <laughs> very caustic in their humor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but so then we we have, we have to cut to King Darius in his bedroom. Is it weird? He still has that very same Ashley Home Furnishings bed yep. that we saw earlier in the film. Same four poster. Yep. Same uh, same drapery. <laughs> yes. You don't throw away a perfectly good bed just because it's a different king's yeah. bed. Well, they right. just put a blanket over the foot locker. So now, well, it's oh, so now it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. A luxurious full size. By the way, I just want right. To yeah, <laughs> right. It's queen. But so, but yeah, but he's too pissed to eat food or fuck his concubines. And by the way, this is the 33rd time I believe that we see that plate of fruit I was talking about earlier. But he's like, no, I don't want to feast on fruit and fuck concubines. I just want to be in silence and think about how sad I am that I had to feed my buddy to lions. Right. Yep. And so we cut back to, to Daniel. He's praying to God that God will save him from the lions. He's like, save me from these ravenous beasts. And I'm like, they're right there, dude. I don't, think we, <laughs> there's no reason to be like that about it. And then we cut to the bad guys, the guys who conspired to have him thrown in here, right? And they're all feasting and laughing and they're like, ah, oh, we sure did get away with it, huh? <laughs> yeah, they got, they got a whole, there's a one moment that's really weird where one of them is like, they're cheersing to the lions. Yes. And they say, who show no partiality to a Hebrew than any other man, uh, you know, whatever they say. And I was just like, are, we're toasting non-bigotedness? I just... I, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, to, to, Dan, it's 2024. The Jews will take what they can get. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, but, we, you know, Darius sleeps fitfully that night. But we cut back to Daniel and he's fine. The the lions, are, he gives him some scritches. I mean, he doesn't, right? Because he's never actually in the same room as these lions. We right. see the lions yeah. or Daniel, but but he's fine. Yeah, I really wanted him when he was out. He was like, you don't even smell like lion. <laughs> <laughs> I did like the moment where the bright light appears to Daniel as yes. he's, you know, praying or whatever. I was really hoping Hagrid would appear again. But yeah, he's <laughs> no, damn, damn it. It blew their wad on that one already. <laughs> but he's like, hey, by the way, God, I'm going to totally tell everybody about this, about how awesome you were about this. 
you have rescued me from the mouth of lions. And I'm like, well, the cage of lions. I mean, yeah, there I was right in there. You didn't do circus tricks while you were right, in Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, okay. So the next morning, Darius shows up and he, he runs through the dungeon to find out if Daniel's okay. And he looks through the window and he's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And he's like, yeah, no, actually, I'm I'm just fine. No, no action in this movie yet. Oh, my God. <laughs> he looks through this little window and he's like, Daniel, Daniel, are you still in there? Like, first of all, wouldn't he just assume that it's a bloodbath that he's about to see? You wouldn't, you you don't call out to the guy that was. Right. You would, you would say, hey, guys, um, is my buddy all bloody and in pieces in there? Yeah. yeah. And then he looks at it and little Daniel just, he's been sitting on the floor and he just peers behind yes, the, the, just, the corner. Just this little, it was a weird, I I laughed for a, for a year. It was uh, it was very um, <laughs> whack-a-mole the way he yeah. appeared in that window. Yeah, yeah. God, God saved me and everything, but I, I don't want to push it, so I've kind of been <laughs> holding up over here, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so yeah, so but he's like, so did your your God miracle you? And he's like, yeah, totally. Either that or the lions weren't hungry. He's like, either way, I'm letting you out by again opening the door completely <laughs> wide open yes. and stepping yeah. aside while whatever wants to walks out of there. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> They they have never seen somebody try to go into the backyard without letting the dogs out. Yeah, right. Was that, yeah, well, like right. if right Daniel had made his way out in that way that people who own German shepherds have to, just like no, no, <laughs> right, pushing yeah. him no. back with his Knee foot him in the it's, face. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and one interesting thing in the Aramaic here in the text, this is very clearly a hole in the ground because Daniel is lowered into the pit and Daniel is brought up out of the pit, and then there's that rock that is. Uh, laid over it and and he seals the the stone with his signet ring and everything and so once again the movie's like ah it's a little rich for our blood let's right. yeah they, you <laughs> know all the furniture out of the living room uh paint it <laughs> like brick and uh you know that some pa actually had to call some like you know backhoe rental company and be like okay it costs how much to dig a hole <laughs> yeah. oh right yeah right. that's wow. crazy that is wow do you guys have any holes? <laughs> I, I'm wondering if this movie has lion money. It didn't have down money, right? It couldn't no. afford oh, yeah. down. So, okay. So, but then Darius is like, hey, you know what? While we're here with a bunch of hungry fucking lions, those three guys who tricked me into signing that cuneiform tablet in the first place are right there. So he feeds the other guys to the lions. Not before yelling at them that this Hebrew, meaning Daniel, is my greatest possession. Which was a little yikes. If, yeah. yeah, a little <laughs> yeah. bit, a little bit. But yeah, so they, they push them into that room. We hear a lion roar and that's that, right? Yeah. yeah. So then Darius goes upstairs, I, I guess, or around the corner to issue a new decree, a pro-Daniel's God decree. <laughs> We're all mm -hmm. Jews from now on. Well, but So that's just the, that, that's the funniest fucking thing about this biblically, not in, in the movie, is that like, you know, everybody like even the Bible isn't going to pretend that King Darius became Jewish. So they have to have him constantly being like, I recognize that Jewish God is the right God. I'm not going to do anything about that just yet. I just know <laughs> that they're right is all. Yeah. He's like someone who acknowledges that vegans are right, but cheese is delicious. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, okay, all right. No. Look, Marcus <laughs> lets me fuck a goat on his altar. Okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you God to come out with some goat fucking. It did feel very much like a, well, until tightrope God shows up, lion taming God <laughs> is the true God. <laughs> the answer is still no juggle God. <laughs> and this is being written uh, again in the second century, the Hellenistic period. And, or at least the stories are being finalized in that period. Or as when, I call it, the Bronze Age. <laughs> <laughs> Where, and so like the point is not like we're going to represent them as as changing the kingdom. The point is basically trying to make, trying to insist that, hey, our God's okay. You can tolerate our God. You can let us do our thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to try to stamp out our God uh, using these stories from from much earlier. So the the emperors are kind of just, uh, it's a message for the Hellenistic rulers. Just saying, gotcha. live and let live. I guess. Yeah. The Bible's trying to do like a what your friend who likes spiders does about daddy long legs. Well, they won't hurt you and they get rid of pests. That's what you got <laughs> is. So, but yeah, but the, the, so there's also this awkward moment where he's like, and, and, you know, Jewish God's kingdom will never end. Things are going to be great for the Jews from here on out. Trust me, all going to come up roses. Then this is uh, Darius gives him back, uh, gives Daniel back his clinky bling. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we the, we cut to the wrap up, right? We're going to get the final king, which is, of course, Cyrus, who <laughs> came before Darius. But that's fine. It's just we don't not we don't worry about that. <laughs> right. I love that this this scene starts out with Daniel being like, I'm going to read these old prophecies to you. Let me just look around the room first and see what flags you might be flying. No reason. Hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, and this is truly retcon the closing, right? Because what they're trying to do here is tie all the ahistorical prophecies, both in Daniel and that they made up just for this movie together. Yep. <laughs> to, to the point that at one point, one of the old guys goes, oh, and they call me a shepherd and I was found by a shepherd. So that, that prophecy yeah, is pretty no, much so right. I yeah. the seven of hearts. Right. So he's like, hey, I'm going to read you these prophecies that our God put down hundreds of years ago that curiously are, are really close to you and, and, and predict what you've done. And so he reads them and Cyrus is like, wow, there is no way that you could have possibly known the present. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he literally he literally goes through and says, now, now these prophecies all say, here's what you did. And he lists all of these things that like, yeah. He knew. Right. He already, like, yeah. this, is, already this is not even a good trick. This is not <laughs> even, like, Eli doing mentalism on his bad days. No. no. This is this is me drunk outside a bar doing mentalism at gunpoint, being like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Do you like guns and pointing <laughs> them at people? <laughs> <laughs> you have a shirt. I'm seeing yeah. a shirt. A shirt. Uh, <laughs> redness. And Cyrus is like... It, He's like, I don't care about all this stuff, but he called me a what? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's the, he repeats that over and over again. Like, that's what convinced him. <laughs> it's yeah. like, I, knowing my name is one thing, but s- saying I'm a shepherd, right. that Crazy. is interesting. Right. Who could have possibly imagined that a person in like a sheep based society who was a ruler would think of himself as a shepherd? That's. Yeah. And nobody's used that metaphor for a king before. That's impossible. Just all kings in Mesopotamia for literally over a thousand years. <laughs> so, and I, I love to, because there's actually a moment here where Cyrus goes like, all right, but wait, you told me that you had a story about four kings. Who's this fourth king? And I'm like, it's the, it's the Burger King, man. Come on. Who do you fucking think it is? <laughs> Dummy. But yeah, so he tells him all the different prophecies and he's like, but the, the end prophecy is that you give me a bunch of stuff. And he's like, weird. Weird okay. that that would have been God's last prophecy. <laughs> I know we're like 30 seconds before the end, but I do have to point this out. Remember that they've included this other old guy who's supposed to be the different king he conquered. Croesus. Yeah. Croesus. They have this moment where Croesus goes, hey, should we fact check any of this? And the old guy's like, <laughs> no. And that's it. <laughs> yes. They don't ever go back to it. He's like, according to Daniel's story, Daniel's very trustworthy. What are you? I don't even understand what you're <laughs> yeah. saying. Here. You heard the goons talk about how he has all this integrity. Yeah, right. Like that was right. Daniel in saying that story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's funny about this when uh, Cyrus gives his pronouncement at the end? This is actually how the Hebrew Bible, as it is arranged within the Jewish tradition, ends. The first really? and second Chronicles are placed at the very end, and so Second Chronicles chapter thirty-six, verses twenty-two and twenty-three. The Hebrew Bible ends with Cyrus making this proclamation, and then scene. Oh. And so the and and the idea is that this kind of ends the whole Bible on this note of promise of restoration, we're going to return. Everything's going to go back to the way it used to be. So that's that's the cliffhanger that the Hebrew Bible ends on and then Christians rearrange the Old Testament and we put Malachi <laughs> at the end so it can end with this segue into now here's the guy we were talking about, Jesus. And um, Interesting. Yeah. So they ended this movie on that. Is it like Nehemiah and a couple of the other ones like chronologically after this though? Or am I oh, misremembering? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, the, well, Daniel is, and Daniel's probably uh, the last text of the Hebrew Bible that was actually composed. Gotcha. But yeah, they said it much earlier. So the, the it's not in chronological order at all. Gotcha. Awesome. So yeah, so, but the, we get Cyrus telling them that the Jews can all go home now and they're out of exile and blah, blah, blah. And everybody feels good. But then Daniel has to come and just, but you know, of course- Still sucked for me because I was like 70. So what am I going to go all the fucking way back to? So I didn't get to do it. Oh, look at all those stairs in the promised land. Oh, (laughs) yeah, right, right. I mean, except that what he ends up doing is doing a a 
Bruce Banner at the end of yes, every episode. Totally of fighting. Fighting. We watch him wander <laughs> off into the California brush. Yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> Yeah, he goes. He, he's asking God for more shit at the end. I'm like, I'm like, I feel like God's done plenty for you, dude. In this story, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 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 Dan, we already know how many stars this gets in terms of entertainment, but on a scale of one to five, how did it do in terms of biblical accuracy? So biblical accuracy itself is a bit of a misnomer, but um, in terms of how well it reflected the biblical text, I would say it's like a four and a half. Like it tries to follow it very, very closely, but it's also trying to correct it and improve on it by trying to work in all of these other historical things as well. So, so they try to punch it up a little, punch up to buy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to sex it up a little bit. We're going <laughs> to try to make it sound a little more historical than it really is to the degree we're able. There are some things where they're like, we can't really do anything uh, about this. And so there's only so much makeup you can put on this actor. And so, um, yeah, I would say 4.5 in terms of the Whoa, right. well right. done. It's, it's pretty close. That's the highest anything's been rated for anything in the history on of our show. show. <laughs> I, do, I do believe. All right. So if our audience wanted to learn more from you guys, where should they go? Uh, you know, Data Over Dogma podcast uh, is available on all of the podcasting places. We also do YouTube. So you, if you want to see our gorgeous faces, we're available there. Just look for, just Google or search Data Over Dogma. And uh, and yeah, you'll hear us uh, obviously shred the Bible the way, uh, the way we've been doing. But it's informed shredding. Yeah, right, right. No, I, I, I've learned a lot of awesome stuff today and I, I hope our listeners have as well. All right. Well, a huge thanks, obviously, to the Dan's for helping out today. But but just because we're done with our review of the Book of Daniel doesn't mean we're done with the episode just yet because we still need to re-enlist. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, speaking of prophecy, I thought it was time to turn to one of our more modern prophets. I'm talking about boy band supervillain Clay Clark. Oh, no. And his documentary, The Great Reset versus The Great Awakening. Oh, for fuck's sake. All right. So with that, to look forward to we bring episode 462 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Dan and Dan for he helping us out today. Uh, and be sure to check the show notes for a link to their show and a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn only access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Alien Citation Needed, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Guide, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or set of suggestions, you can email Godawful movies at gmail.com. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnik from the Drafts on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm Delusions, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. Daniel went on to ask if he could be moved to a spot in the Bible further away from Ezekiel. Gallagher lost all his watermelon smashing money speculating on the stock market and became a bitter has-been comic doing racist and homophobic acts at insane clown posse events, had several heart attacks, went on stage, and eventually died. All of that's true. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dan gave Uncle Dan a serious talking to about booking future guest appearances. <laughs> <laughs> That one hasn't happened yet. That oh, one is in the that. future. Prophecy. Yeah. He, he, he it like prophesized the, it. <laughs> it happened in the Bronze Age. <laughs> yeah, I guess that did have a weirdly. Oh, come on, you could do better than that. Kind of, yeah, so sorry about that. Yeah, what are you doing, doing? Crowd work <laughs> on, <laughs> on, on Dan and Dan? Who's fucking tonight? <laughs> Dan. <laughs> oh, you still, know it. <laughs> still got to do the five. Non Uncle Dan, I want you to know that um, as part of this sketch, I fed Jeff GBT your first thesis. And I was like, what's a joke I could make about this? And twice, Chat GBT was like, there aren't really any jokes in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's very serious. The a AI cannot take my job because that's right. They yeah, have you are safe. No idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you went for it there, Dan. You I fucking love went it. for it. Hell yeah. Listen, I was. I, I was classically trained to commit. Right? No, That's I get right. it. I get it. We're, I know, you know when you're working with a pro, damn it. That's right. <clears throat> All right. Interstitial three. <clears throat> I always love this moment that we have um, 
as we do this part of the show with the new guest, where we sort of sort of learn their sense of humor. Right? There's this <laughs> moment where you're like, oh, good. You know? So, I hope they like or, this. Or not, you know? Mm-hmm. Dan um, Dan makes a very solid straight man. That that's is for right. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so far, so good. All right. And uh, Rocket Money ad? The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved. Start your summer road trip at Midas and get up to $30 off your next repair service. Plus, get a free closer look vehicle check to make sure you're road trip ready. If you need brake service, an alignment check, or tune up, hit up Midas for up to $30 off. For more details, request your appointment at Midas.com. Five Below means hot stuff, cool prices. Get the trends in your feed for way less. Candy, beauty, tech, room decor, and more. Plus extreme value finds in our Five Beyond shop. Yep, you could say we're kind of a big deal. Shop in stores and fivebelone.com. This is where projects come to life. Our showrooms are designed to inspire with the latest products from top brands, curated in an inviting, hands-on environment, and a team of industry experts to support your project. We'll be there to make sure everything goes as planned, from product selection to delivery coordination. At Ferguson Bath, Kitchen, and Lighting Gallery, your project is our priority. See the latest designs from your favorite brands, including Signature Hardware, at your local Ferguson showroom. Finances can be so intimidating, but since I've started using Dave, the banking app, managing my money is much easier. Dave shows me how much I have left to spend after my routine expenses. And if I'm short on cash, Dave's extra cash advances me the money I need, up to $500 in five minutes or less. No interest, no credit check, no late fees. Download the Dave app or go to dave.com slash easy. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Eligibility criteria and instant transfer fees apply. Advances typically approved in five minutes. Banking services provided by Evolve Bank and Trust.